Welcome back to the second day of the London Conference on Climate Change. I've been told to expect a special announcement today. I don't know exactly when it's going to be. But we have many esteemed speakers here, including Piers Corbyn, and he's just about to start. Was supposed to be held at um, the uh, exact uh, This uh, conference was supposed to be held at the UCL College, um, but they were blocked. Um, the booking for the uh, the Pearson Lecture Room at UCL was blocked uh, by Professor John Butterworth. Head of Physics and Astronomy Department at UCL. Um, he basically did not allow them to use the facilities. He said, It has been brought to my attention that you have booked a room at UCL for an external conference in September for a rather fringe group discussing aspects of climate change. I will allow oh. people I'll out here right for you. Please come. Uh, I can see you. Uh, Philip Foster, you are the next chairman. Please enter. <coughs> In short, we ended up at the Conway come Hall come. after being no booted out of UCL. Come, come. There is so much money tied up. In the CO2 is bad hoax. You can charge green taxes just for people oh, well producing done, the gas of life for plants. World is inverted. And oil and gas are not fossil fuels either. That's something I found out yesterday. Natural product of the earth. CO2 in the atmosphere would be a good thing. Just look at um, how they grow wonderful tomatoes and greenhouses at this okay, auxiliary. Good morning, welcome back to the second day of the conference. Uh, we'll see if it works. It's sensitive. <laughs> from what we are seeing in the past 
if you just put it uh, forward, ignoring the longer term uh, variation. But if you take the longer term variation, you would have a similar, maybe a similar difference here. You go into a um, climatic uh, solar low, so we would go into a colder period. That's what that. And of course, um, Moncton's wonderful speedometer, climatic speedometer. With this in there, we see the use of this into the discussion of various things. And then we peek here, we pay uh, about them, um, uh, especially here on the uh, so called extreme events, which in which uh, Kamika is the real world specialist. And uh, on the ethics here, of course, and of course, we end with this very interesting. Over to a general discussion, which is very open and it goes on for one and a half hours. Um, we have a commentary, commentary notes, and you should not forget them because they include a lot of very <coughs> material, uh, and they are directly linked to what we have been saying. Here is a good on sea level because we have sea level today. And other things, we should not forget about uh, the Great Barrier Reef, I was from the store, says that it's complete exclusion. And of course, we have the dense program. Please, again, the same thing as yesterday. You must keep the version, must watch the time. You have the egg boiler, cooking uh, controller. You have questions and comments. Should be to the point, but not just questions, also comments, because this is the right thing. But give your name before you are doing this, because we had a Norwegian film recording. And we have this meeting here. <coughs> well, it is our meeting. It was just that we were thrown out into darkness when we were no longer allowed to be in the um, uh, university college of London. <coughs> and we had to find a venue. And that means that it was seven times more expensive. And we had no money for that. But you, you in the audience, no organization. You have contributed. Now we have a long, long list. I hope I got them all because I added this to the same yesterday. I will clean it up and even get them. Uh, There's a lot of people, all private companies, so we have no uh, oil industry organization or so. And we have this thing, we, of course, we, we have a dense thing here to have it presented. We have a general discussion to come. Um, the real world <coughs> is very important that we discuss them and we go forward on this second day as we did before. And somebody has wrote in the letter, all these slides make my head spin. Somebody here knows who it was, but it was a very nice saying of it because we are coming into issues. Where it's really surprising. Uh, well, facts is fact and ways of looking. But that's why I have this picture on page 79 with the duck, duck or the or, 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 or the rabbit. It depends upon how you see it, how you interpret things. And they may there you must res respect for it. But when people start to fiddle with things, then it's something different. We will have that for sure in sea level. Because that is, what is being said is not what is being, being true. And we have it wherever we look. Um, this is, of course, the essence today. It's being said that we will go to 2.7 plus and minus in, in this year. But if you go to the real readings, we are far, far below that. That's very, very, very important. Obviously, there is a disagreement between models and observations. The scientists, why do they put trust in models or in observations? I have no doubt why I put them. But there is also this rabbit and duck research. So we can discuss it all. And then, uh, then we come to the agreement, what to, how should we use the debate? Therefore, it is urging me to go back to the primary facts. Ad hominus, I think. Uh, and maybe we have just a little illusion. This is taken 
from your uh, from your conference book. And uh, make it up. Uh, there's very little effect on the global that no effect on sea level, no negative on acidification. We had uh uh hold on set talking about that, we have talked about that today. Therefore it's a recent uh, the recent rise uh, rather seems to be beneficial to planet planet. Hence the planet uh, and it's a question of to go to a low carbon earth at least from the point where we see because it's primarily <laughs> sun. Yesterday I had also a um, picture about the different threats to, to, to uh, life on earth. As we, uh, you have the natural disaster, you have the terror of vigor of things, and you have the man-made disasters, and you have those things which I call imagined. It is interesting that when you were sleeping this night, uh, quite a strong atomic bomb was being thrown in uh, North Korea. That's real threats and wars and all these things we have around us. Uh, it is something where I think that we have no time and we have no right to diverge into what scientifically looks like illusions. And that was why I used the sword and cut off this illusion. Because it's really something very, very upset <coughs> for my life. In this conference room, for example, uh, we were not allowed to, to announce this online. Because it was controversial. <laughs> Everyone can think of think it's controversial, doesn't matter. But people had formed. So we were there. But then you could read this pamphlet which is out there telling what they really are promoting here. All the free speech and animal rights and all these things. So as somebody here who's yelling said, okay, they promote animal rights but not human rights. <laughs> and, so, what they were, Whatever. This was an ingression, now over to the challenge. Stronger in stopping the heat. 
heat, what they call it heat at that time. Of course, this was. This was also taken up by others. Already in 1827, Fourier wrote in French here that uh, maybe this gas is stop heat and uh, help us keep the temperature here on Earth. And uh, to the right, this uh, famous paper by Sante uh, Arrhenius, who took up the ideas from Tyndall and from, from Fourier here and, and said that the, the, the gases in the atmosphere, especially the <coughs> carbon dioxide, could stop the heat. And, and change the atmosphere and the temperature of the Earth. But um, don't go back to a very simple experiment. This is Tyndall's experiment, as we can do it today. Here is a bottle in the middle. It's a plastic bottle, and there's a heater over here. We send the heat through this bottle, and in here is a, a styrofoam thing. And inside is simply a piece of paper, black paper. And if uh, you heat up here and you have air, oh, yeah. this paper yeah. heats up because yeah. hot uh, radiation comes to you and warms the paper. And you can measure the, te the temperature on the paper, on the back side of the paper. At the same time, you can measure the temperature inside the, this bottle. And of course, then you can put CO2 into the bottle and see what happens. Very simple experiment. Yeah, very simple. So the result is here. On the top you see, if we put in CO2, it doesn't warm as much. So it's clearly here that CO2 absorbs heat. But if we measure the temperature inside the bottle, the same temperature in both cases. So CO2 stops the heat, but it doesn't warm the what's inside the bottle. So what happens? What happens here? Yeah. Where is the missing heat? What is wrong with this experiment? Okay, you can think about that. It's very simple. Let's say experiment here. You have a heater here. The bottle here is tied up to the styrofoam so that it cannot heat from other directions. And the piece of paper in the middle and it's measured on the back side. That's going to be done in your basement or your kitchen. But um, the one that didn't trust Arrhenius' interpretation was Professor Wood, and he has a PhD in philosophical magazine in 1909. He did an experiment with, with a glass house. He built a small box with a glass, and then he had also a roof in the, with the rock salt, which transmitted heat, we had found out. So he yeah. had to make this roof of rock salt. But, but what he said was that uh, it was clearly a uh, there uh, a difference of one degree between the two enclosures. Very different. And this experiment has sort of stopped the discussion uh, around 1910. It was taken up much later. I would not want to go into that history, but in, uh, it was repeated only in 2011 in New Mexico by Professor Nave. We repeated in a 1909 experiment. Uh, we have done it also in, in Oslo, so I will show you that later. So what we but now listen. And Gore has also done it. Despite the noise about uncertainty in the political arena, warming will actually save lives, not endanger them. Do I believe scientists? No! The fundamentals of climate change have been understood by scientists for decades. To start with, there are naturally occurring gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane, in the Earth's atmosphere. In themselves, they aren't bad. In fact, we need them in limited quantities to keep our atmosphere at just the right temperature for life as we know it to exist on Earth. But if we produce an excess of these gases, as we have, the temperature rises as it has. Hmm. If you want, you yes. can replicate this effect yourself in a simple lab experiment. Here's how. Take two identical bottles and set them side by side. Put a thermometer in each bottle and seal them. Fill the hose from a source of CO2 into one of the bottles. Shine two heat lamps of equal intensity at equal distance onto each one. 
Within minutes, you will see the temperature of the bottle with the carbon dioxide in it rising faster and higher. <laughs> the bottles are like our atmosphere. The lamps are like our sun. Most of the solar radiation reaching the Earth is absorbed by the surface and atmosphere, which in turn radiates energy out towards space as infrared energy, heat. Most of the heat energy from the surface is then absorbed by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and radiated back down toward the surface. The more greenhouse gases we create, the more heat is absorbed and sent back toward the surface to cause further warming. This it's not there because now comes all the bad things that happen when we have CO2. <laughs> by more than 16 people. <coughs> Obviously believe that within minutes the, the, the yard with the CO2 will be warmer. That is a very nice presentation by what's, uh, what's at that on the website. You may look at that and read about the details. But this is clearly a fraud. And, uh, you see the temperature should rise quickly in a few minutes. But this are not two different thermometers. It's the same thermometer. Because these are handmade, and you can see there are some small areas. There are some drops here, some bottom here. And so they, they are different. So there should show a difference if you compare. And here is a comparison. There is no difference between the two thermometers, just the steam or mercury. So it's the same thermometer in two different stages. And here is the experiment done properly. And you see the A, the blue one, with the air rising faster, <laughs> the CO2 one rising slower. And it doesn't take two minutes, it takes about two hours to, to get to the top. Wow. So this is done properly with the detector inside. But the, the last thing is. <coughs> so these jars have big, big, thick glass on top, so they don't transmit radiation at all. They are warmed by the lamp, which heats the top, so that's a warm surface. So what you uh, actually measure here is conduction inside <laughs> the gas. And the air has 26 millivolts per meter per Kelvin, while the CO2 has 17. That's why it is better with air than with CO2. So that's not at all what they can do. But they will believe it. Six million people believe that they can do this. Can you experiment. use a mic, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. So, of course, the greenhouse idea, or how it works with the glass, is that the radiation from the sun comes into the greenhouse. We have some short rays in the ground, warm the air rises, and and heats the greenhouse at the conduction and the evaporation and so on. And that doesn't go through the walls and the roof. Some low waves go through the roof and the infrared waves are stopped. That's of course a glass house. But um, today it's very simple to make a house that transmits also infrared radiation by this uh, film. It's a called clink in, in, in English, I understand, and plastic wrap in American. It's very thin. And you see the red curve, it transmits all the uh, wavelengths out to 13 microns, like an acid stop at 2 microns. So we can make a very simple house wow. with this type of roof and repeat these experiments. So that's why it's now very easy to do in the schools. We go to, to the school shop and make some boxes which we have done in a school in Oslo. And there are the two people on the, on the balcony that helped in this experiment. And the man with the, yeah, the camera, he with the boxes. He's a very good teacher. Yes. <laughs> and um, over to the right, we have a sensor, a temperature sensor, and we have a computer to uh, record the data. And we calibrate the sensors in water before we start. And, uh, we have four equal lamps, and there's a wall between each box, so that doesn't come into the second or third box, and we record. And here is Professor Wood's experiment, repeated. This is an example where we have four different 
Das Bein drückt, about 20 degrees higher, and then the glass roof, even 4 degrees higher than that. So you see, making, in fact, this is without the roof, but just walls, just to make a wall in the house, make it warmer, but put on the roof, it's much, much stronger, because now we stop the air from moving. But you also see here the blue one, that is the, the infrared transparent roof. It is faster because our film is more transparent for, for all wavelengths than glass. But of course here the glass keeps the, the radiation inside and becomes warmer. So this is uh, Professor Wood's experiment. It's completely correct. But we wanted to do more. We wanted to fill it with CO2. We have CO2 in the box, we fill it and we have a flame and it is extinguished here. So it's no oxygen is left. And here is the difference between the foil and the air. The beginning is started one little bit early, but it ended up with a zero difference. Here we turn the, the power off, and you see it's, it cools faster with CO2. So we didn't, didn't prove it, didn't prove it in this experiment. But we have one other source, and that was the lamps. It is very difficult to get four lamps to have exactly the same, same amount of radiation, we found out. So we have to do it outside. And that also is a big challenge, because also we have wind, we have, don't have much clear sky, and we have clouds in the sky, of course. But we made it an outside version, and here we also wanted to see if we could, could um, Measure the climate sensitivity by doubling the amount of CO2 and see what temperature differences we get. So we have 400, 800, and 1600 millimeters of CO2 into these boxes, factor of 2. And you see the result here. So here we have four boxes. The top one has uh, ambient mixture, 700 ppm it was that day. And these have 400, 800, 400 milliliter, 800, and 1600. They were all colder, cooler than the one with yes, CO2. So in this case, we get a negative. So much for global warming. Sorry. Of course, we can play the trick that this uh, IPCC does and, and come. And cut and compute it. We got these four points. Of course, if you have any this point, we could see that it's increasing. But we really have this as a zero point, and we have a logarithmic scale as they use. We got minus 0.11 plus minus 11. So, <laughs> of course, it's. Yeah. We'll look on. It's still than the zero, of course. But it's very, very difficult to say that this is a positive slope. <laughs> That's what happened in, in greenhouse. Of course, it doesn't mean that it happens in the atmosphere, but at least that's how what we get. And finally, this is only four days ago. We have waited all summer to get a clear morning in, in Oslo. We got on the last Sunday. <laughs> so this is a very fresh result. And now we put one, two, two other boxes with 100% CO2 and two with air to have a double check. And of course, we are experimenters. We don't we got one to become warmer and the other to be colder. That's how experimenters have it. Of course, we can take, take the average, and you see then this, the average of CO2 is, is colder than the air. But of course, here we have some hidden problems that we have two different, we, didn't, we were not able to show that both of them were cool. So, how it is? So I think it's more likely zero or, or negative, also in this case. So that's very happy today. This was done only four days ago, so we have to think about how to improve this experiment. The problem is when you are outside, you have also a wind coming, you have clouds. You see the bump here, there's no small clouds. 
you recognize above the uh, temperature as published by the British Address Center. And I've added <coughs> more recent measurements by satellite, either from remote sensing system or by the University of Alabama at Huntsville. They gave nearly the same results. And you see a number of climate changes. Cooling, heating, cooling, heating, and for a number of years, years what is called a pause. You see the two warm have the same amplitude. <coughs> the first one from 1910 up to 1945 was at a time where the uh, CO2 emissions were six times lower than during the second war with same amplitude. But then CO2 emissions were six times larger should be. In between, there has been a cooling. So, where is a back piece? Back piece? Yes, thank you. So, there is no evidence of a correlation between CO2 emission and temperature. Next one, please. There is a good fit. It's a very simple sine function. A 60-year cycle, as Nicolas Cafeta told us yesterday. And to this 60-year cycle, when asked just to add a straight line, the slope is 0.06 <coughs> degrees period. 0.006. Next, please. That means since the beginning of acceleration of CO2 emissions, we have experienced a warming of 0.4 degrees Celsius. 0.4 degrees Celsius is the increased temperature that we experience in the Loire Valley by a beautiful sunny day in a quarter of an hour. And you know what? We survive! <laughs> Next please. So, catastrophic anthropogenic uh, greenhouse warming, as it is called, is essentially predicted by models. Here are the models in the IPCC AR5 report. Uh, First, let's have a look if the model is validated by the past <coughs> observations. They are not. In, in particular, between 1910 and 1945, the increase that has been observed is not formed by the model. They are wrong. And it's even worse, next slide, please, if we uh, see uh, since the End of <laughs> oh God. the last century, it's even worse. Because you see, this spaghetti is. Well, they are all out of each other. And they are all wrong. But maybe one. But all of them are wrong. And what is the meaning of taking the average of wrong results? It's meaningless, isn't it? Yes. Next, so, uh, I guess these uh, problems encountered and will be more and more encountered by the C and IP5 models is that they simply ignore the natural variability, in particular this 60 degree cycle. This cycle is seen on temperature, no, it also seen in sea level or ice. I just I've asked the computer, please tell me what is the best sign function to fit sea uh, level rise as reported by the ER, ER5 report. Well, it gives exactly the same 60 year cycle as for temperature. 
And this is also true, but of course it's a little bit uh, exaggerated because we have just half a cycle for C uh, ice theory anomaly, but it works also. We have to see in the future if it continues to work or not. Next bit. This is not the scoop, in addition to uh, Nicolas Capetta, many other people have published about this 60 year cycle. And uh, with first one 20 years ago, cycle related to the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, possibly also, as published by Nicolas Capetta, a planetary tide of sun. Next, please. So, how do most of them? Well, there are essentially two plots warming and heating and uh, cooling. They grow with aerosols. They warm with climate sensitivity. CO2 mass, etc. That paper from 1971 by Basil and Schneider in science <coughs> two things. One, Climate sensitivity they took at that time was 0.8 kV for me. And they also insist, well, to say it's cooling and therefore aerosols are more efficient than climate sensitivity. Uh, and therefore they insist that the runaway greenhouse effect does not occur because the 50 micron bound, CO2 bound, which is the main source of absorption in this, in this conclusion, saturates, okay, saturates, that's a key point. After one, after that, so they definitely the still uh, warmer, uh, cooler, sorry, cooler than that. And then, it did not happen because temperature raised for 30 years. And therefore, since the Charnay report, uh, the climate sensitivity is considered to be at an average of 3 degrees with a very large uncertainty from 1.5 to 4.5. That has not changed since that time. Except that since now we encounter a pause, we will see in the next slide that climate sensitivity is decreasing versus your publication. Next please. So, um, I think a number of people are even in this room. Uh, I've just plotted the published average value of climate sensitivity. You know there are two definitions. One is transient, the other is at the equilibrium. But anyway, tendency is the same. I mean there is a decrease of 10% per year versus your publication. And in particular, you note that since the uh, publication of the AI5 IPCC report, uh, all the data published are below 3 degrees. What will remain for COP31 if you extrapolate? Well, value will be zero. Next, please. So, uh, normally uh, we talk about the pose in the low troposphere. But if you see the definition of the greenhouse effect given in the TR5 report, I've copied it above, you see this. Uh, in the absence of these absorbers, because of the decline of temperature with altitude in the troposphere. That's true. Okay? That's the explanation given for the greenhouse effect in the air 5 report, which has little to do with the true greenhouse room. Little to do. So, let's check if, by this, this definition, Temperature decreased as is expected. Next slide, please. You see, I've taken the paper by 
Because we don't involve the day, they calculate the expected decrease of temperature near the tropopoles, and then found minus 2.4 degrees. Actually, the measurements, by either by remote system or by University of Alabama at Angeles, different survey, they found the same results, no change. No change. So, the theory is not validated by experiment. I'm sorry. And I, I would suggest that we have to capitalize on the pause at this uh, altitude, which is in the low stratosphere, because this is there where the uh, definition given by IPCC normally should happen. And it doesn't. Next, please. Conversely, this uh, lack of temperature change would be compatible with the climate sensitivity equal or lower than 0.6 degrees. 0.6 degrees. And this is just the value published by Hermann Arde uh, in 2014 in a very big paper. He used all CO2 and water vapor in the atmosphere and so on and calculate all that to arrive to this result of 0.6 degrees for the climate sensitivity. <coughs> Next please. So, how to understand this? It's complicated, contrary to the theory on which are based CMIP, uh, IPCC models. Okay? Let's have a look on the infrared spectrum. For those who are not familiar with that, I understand this is a little bit complicated, but we will concentrate on the CO2 band with a uh, circle, with a red circle, the main CO2 band. You have the measurements in the atmosphere below the point, below the tropopause in the lower part of the figure, and you have the value of the spectrum above the tropopause. Okay? You see in both cases, for this 15 micron CO2 band, it is saturated below the tropopause and above the tropopause. This is because the absorptivity is nearly 100%. You see? That's very, that's very important. Because, uh, <coughs> next slide please. What happens in the tropopause? There is a decrease of temperature upon this altitude. You experience this in the mountain and also uh, in the plain. When we go, you see outside temperature is minus 55 degrees. This is what we can experiment. But you see that since it is still, absorptivity is still 100% to the so above the propose. You see, the regime is completely different. So the regime is completely different. And then, temperature doesn't longer decline with altitude, even increases a little bit. But this is easy to understand why temperature is flat. Nothing happens. Next, please. So, this was for the so called dangerous scale of the effect. We see that in Africa. Or oh, it's so tiny that it's very difficult to appreciate it. So tiny. Let's have a look on the benefit of CO2. Here is the, uh, what is called the seasonal oscillation of CO2 in the atmosphere. Every spring, summer, there is a decrease of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the CO2 that is heated by vegetation in spring and summer. And since there is more vegetation in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere, we essentially see the uh, effect average and it is in spring and summer that the CO2 decreases. But the amplitude of this decrease is not the same. You see below it's Antarctica. 
In Antarctica, there are practically no seasonal oscillation because there is no vegetation. Okay. In, at Mauna Loa, this is in the center of the Pacific Ocean. The amplitude is a little bit larger, but we can find a larger amplitude near La Jolla, this is in California. In California, the amplitude is still larger, because of course there is more vegetation. And you see also that the amplitude at the beginning of the measurements and at the end of the experiment, the amplitude is not the same. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, you see, between 1969 and 2013, it has been increased, but it has increased faster than the increase of CO2 itself in the atmosphere. That means that this is a measurement of the benefit for vegetation. 71% faster than the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is very important. This has been evaluated by Credit Zoo to benefit from one game of more than $3,000 million. It's fantastic. So, also it increased crop yields. This has been measured. There have been uh, published, paper published in Nature, Nature Climate Change this year that shows this is uh, benefit is the equivalent of a sixth continent. The URI is four times that of the European community. Uh, before Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Next please. <laughs> Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a conclusion. The, all this suggests a change of paradigm. I mean the benefits, the benefit for monkey of this increase of CO2 definitely is important. Why the catastrophic effect is not important at all. And even all the observations do not fit with this catastrophic prediction. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <coughs> I think it's going to be Piers Corbin next. Tell people to watch Piers Corbin. With his globe. Was it gone with the previous person?
was went deeper and quicker than standard ecology was saying, and in particular, it's very interesting to see that he got that point up. Um, so you've got the point is on the desk, is it? On this one. Yeah, okay. Um, press the sun. Press the sun. Yes, okay. it's there. Oh, the sun. I like pressing the sun. Okay. Um, the rate of fall of pressure was uh, pretty close to the peak of this big activity, um, and the minimum was reached just before or around the drop. I mean, it will take the time which will be beyond me completely sure. Um, and significantly, the uh, storm drifted to the right, and they were so much drifted that uh, there was no um, This is part of our process that the R5s will give storms drifting to the right in the northern hemisphere. Okay, uh, next one please. Yeah, this is a recent thing uh, just to show you what's been going on in September. Um, we're quite pleased with this because it was quite fine when we started this. Uh, there is some low coming in. Uh, this is, well that's the end of so this is the night. But there is at least some low pressure coming in. Um, <coughs> we'd like it to hold off so I'm not coming too far. Alright, next one please. Uh, this is just to show you what our forecasts look like uh, when we um, publish them as the British Isles map there and we have a, a graph included. Um, uh, there's uh, eight pages, there's a lot of work, no, about six pages to British Isles. Um, okay, a heat wave we mentioned, which we have one. Next one, please. Um, the point uh, of relevance to CO2, of course, is the solar lunar action technique where we can predict the weather in detail. Within a day or so, um, from up to six months or even a year ahead on occasions. Whereas CO2 theory can predict really nothing. Here's an example here we've got some trial forecasts where we talk about the likely risk of um, earthquakes in, in some of these uh, R5 or R4 periods, uh, or even R3 on occasions. But, and this happened in this one, and it was brief, like in France and so on, uh, in line with the general predictions. Um, Okay, next one. Um, this is just a quick list of our things we have predicted of great importance uh, since since 2010. It's Russian heat wave, super cold in Britain, USA cold winter, this hurricane Irene, which is highly significant, uh, uh, and many other things not listed. Um, okay, next one, please. Uh, this is a recent one to show you USA maps. That was July the 20th, 23rd. We predicted uh, uh, a thunder of sunstorms, so I was sort of there, yeah, and uh, it's one of them uh, in that time period. Next one, please. Um, the solar lunar action technique is most skilled at predicting storms, and here we have a list of the British Isle storms of greatest significance in the last three years. Um, we predicted all of them, and uh, <coughs> that was the big one, which was uh, in southern and southeast England. If we go to the next slide. Um, we predicted that six months ahead, and now to announced it at the uh, Grain and Allied Food Trade Association Conference in Geneva. Um, there, and it definitely happened. We also said it was going to be very severe. Um, on a par with six extreme what, events in 1987, for example, which it was, but not in Britain, it was in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, it hit a very notable storm called the Rose. Um, uh, we didn't say precisely where it would be, so we were pleased with that. Next one, please. Uh, at the same time as that, there was another storm in America. Often these things come simultaneously all around the world. Which, of course, is not anything that standard meteorology can predict. Because something moving at the speed of sound wouldn't be able to connect these two systems. Right? So it must be something beyond driving. Next one. Yeah, this is to get us back into where it all come from. Now, we know, you see, we've got these well known correlations between the temperatures and uh, activity. It's more than minimum, more than minimum, and so on. Uh, so next one, please. Yeah, just okay. Ten minutes now. So I'm quite a bit behind where I'm faster. So there's a Fourier analysis of uh, data that shows we've got an 11 year cycle in geomagnetic and 22 year ions in solar. Uh, in, in, sorry, in 
temperatures, which means the temperatures are somehow magnetically driven by the Hales cycle, which is alternate by the alternate magnetic fields of the Okay, next one. Um, as it will work well, the skill of what we have, the next one as well, please, is uh, we can predict changes in the jet ski. Okay? Uh, next one. Basic idea, if there is going to be magnetic leaks and there are lunar modulation leaks of 18.6, then the patterns repeat roughly in 132 years. So next one. Now, this isn't clockwork, I hasten to add, but there's a list of some repeat patterns to be expected. And go to the next one. This is what happened. This was 2007 summer, we warned the floods, 2008, 2009. These were all periods where the Met Office had predicted barbecue summers. <laughs> yeah. If you have a barbecue on a barge, it's okay. <laughs> Alright, next one please. Um, summer 2010, we predicted big, big events to move the west, uh, move the jet stream to knock out the uh, West Russian heatwave, which worked very well. Next please. Yes, we predicted the coldest December in a hundred years, and it happened, and it was, must be true, because David Cameron said it would happen. <laughs> <laughs> Brexit means Brexit. <laughs> hey, no, no, not yet. Um, I'd have to do a quick show. You'll have to give me an extra minute. I've got still an extra minute. <coughs> right. Okay. Um, <coughs> Dick said, phone me, Julius, and asked me, would I come on the morning breakfast show? I said, yeah, sure. Uh, but, and then they said, oh, we're going to rent a cab and phone you back. No, nobody phoned me back. So I phoned them and said, uh, what's going on? They said, oh, uh, Mr. Corby, we've, um, 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 I said, what's the problem? They said, uh, we've got someone else. I said, who? He said, oh, I'll tell you. I said, this is Kevin. You, you, you know. He said, yes, we do know. Yes, I do. I said, so they told me. They said, you've got the chief scientific advisor for the government. <laughs> and I said, he knows F.A. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I used the Queen's English version. Um, and I haven't heard from them since. Well, I've been here from them. Not that um, Next one, please. Yes. Our revolution is we can predict the movement of the jet stream. Next one. Um, and the extreme events that are happening now are caused by big variations in the jet stream. So when this goes a long way south, you get cold air and so forth. So you get big temperature contrasts as a consequence of big wave south of the jet stream which we predicted. This is different from the jet stream expectations of standard neutrology under global warming. They will have a shorter jet stream, generally warmer at the top, um, uh, are you generally warmer, so the colder region is smaller, shorter jet stream, less wave. That is not happening. We have the wrong type of extremes. Next one. Um, this is where we get the beats of the uh, 60-year cycle from, and you see when they publish this sudden rise, they say, I'm going to tell you about that, but these two here, and thank you for the Lord here who uh, provided this graph. Um, okay, next one, I've got to go very fast now, uh, that, that's the practicalities of it, next one. Um, yeah, uh, stunning interesting this, that the period of the nodal crossings of the moon is the same as the what you see of the rotation period of the magnetic field of the sun as a sort of average. One point more. This only happens in one other planet involving whole numbers. Sharon and Pluto have a ratio like that of four. All the other planets in the solar system is nothing like that. So there's something going on, we think, about rotation and so on between Planets and their moons, if they're of similar mass, similar within, you know, we have a big moon compared with others, you see. Next one. Uh, this shows you why um, we just have to go past it, but it's, it's about magnetic connections. Next one, please. Uh, anything that happens up there, i.e., there's a whole lot of electric currents happening here which are connected to the jet stream and connected to the weather. So the uh, magnetic effects are going to be very important in connecting to this. Next one, please. Um, we've even got space lighting which goes to the strike sort of time. Next one, please. Um, we discussed this before, it takes too long to explain, but we are very convinced from data observed, we've got eight of these graphs, that the only known is a solar magnetic driven uh, phenomenon. Okay.
uh, it could be triggered as well, but that's the main attribute of it. It means it's strong attacks, in effect, in the polar regions. Next, please. Uh, same thing, yeah, next one. Yes, now this is, just to be clear, there's some stuff on the side, hasn't it? But things are... Are they coming? Yes. Can you show the yes. sides now? Yeah, it's oh, come, it's come down. Things are not always what they see. You see, you can draw these diagrams. Water is flowing uphill. Yeah, you can see, it's flowing uphill. So that's, but if you try and make that, you find the book doesn't fit together. Um, and of course, you see, we've got problems with, when you write equations and so on and draw diagrams. You think, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, two problems. One is the centres of motion of the solar system swirling around. You think, oh, yeah, this is mixing the sun around. Well, hang on. Everything is in free fall. Uh, and the stuff going on, yes, but it's not as simple as that. It's like saying, we are moving now at 600 miles an hour and from the start. Well, we are. But I don't feel distressed by it. You see what I mean? So it's, it's a question of, it, 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 it's not as simple as that. Um, the arrows of radiation, the next one, of course, are popping up. But you see, if you draw this diagram, you think, oh God, it must be true. It must be true. Look, look. Two arrows come from here, one goes that way, one goes that way, basically. So the CO2 there is causing an extra arrow. So this must be warm. Well, yeah, that's what they're saying. But it is it's popping up, because what's happening here, we've got a black body radiation. But quantum gas, right? And what happens is this surface is in equilibrium with a box of uh, radiation there. And this surface here is in equilibrium with a box of radiation there. So these arrows are delusional nonsense, they, they don't happen. Uh, it isn't like that at all. It's local uh, equilibrium. Okay, next one. Um, what is all going on, as uh, Neil Jackson Moore pointed out? Reality goes this way, not that way. Next one. Um, well, now in the little mini ice age of beginnings of, where we can see a whole number of things happening and already seen, and notably uh, wild jet stream and massive hail events at times. Next one. And most important slide. Weather-wise, in terms of solar activity, the averages are doing this. And last time they did that, though, in 10 hail cycles ago, we had a big plunge of temperature. We are at the knee, so there's only one way to go. Unless physics has changed fundamentally, which of course is what the IPC seems to be telling us. But I don't know if it's going to change anywhere else apart from in their heads. Okay, yeah. next one. Um, yes, now, CO2, I've been doing this in a short time. But we know it's nonsense, not because we're so smart at predicting anything, that is completely irrelevant actually. It is nonsense because it fails in its own terms. Okay, next one. Um, that's the list of what they said would happen. This is what did happen. <coughs> Not happen. Um, next one. Uh, what about the economic and political impacts of the uh, climate change story? Well, there's quite a lot of things, but they are all bad. Uh, I mean, they're bad to deindustrialization of the United Kingdom and various countries. And it's important to understand that it's, it's an ideological question. Man-made climate change is an ideological message. And when America and China agree it must be happening, <laughs> then you know it must be true. <laughs> and that means you've got to pay your god money tax for greenness and saving the planet. And if you don't, you're a climate change denier, you're a racist, conspiracy theorist, and so on. Okay. Next one. So we're going, we're going up there with big forces, you understand that? Um, the actual facts of the CO2, it does not, or the, the policies, they don't reduce CO2 production, they move CO2 production from, in the case of Britain, from Teesside to India. It, it's not reducing any of that thing, but it's reducing jobs in Britain. Um, it's pushing up energy and oil prices, and they all of much love that, apart from the Saudi Arabia. It's not meant to run the world. Can you give me the slide? Um, uh, the next one, we've got to get to our um, slaughter of the second case. Next one, please. Move hastily on. Uh, science requires evidence, very good. Next one. Uh, next one, there's not much CO2 around. Next It's 
not a word I try. Okay, next one. Oh, the fourth one. Next one. <coughs> next one. We we'll get to the lobby. Yeah, real temperatures are going down. Next one. Uh, that's the trickery graph showing how they're going down. Next one. Um, right. What you've got to do is this is the penultimate slide. Okay. The answer to it all is you've got to enjoy life. We call it a conspiracy because it requires that man <coughs> can dictate to nature what is going to happen to nature. So it requires a conspiracy of nature in order for man to be God. Now this is complete poppycock doubling and madness. It's more crazy than all the conspiracy theories in the world put together. Okay, I move on. Um, well, can I just finish it? What we have to do, that's the list. Here's the sacred cows we have to destroy, i.e. 97% science back the theory of truth, and so forth. A list of untrue things, the end of snow, not true. And we've got to advance real science and call the fraudsters to account. And the question I want you to think about, if we do crack it and have a conference here or somewhere, giving all the answers, more or less, to climate and weather, would we get something? I mean, I think it would improve us, and it would be good, but I, I, the CO2 story is very bad. And the last thing was, we've got the, oh, I put Brexit. <laughs> Sorry, I should say, Bill Clexit. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired of that. Bill Clexit, worldwide, and everything has been done. Thank you. Moments, well, yes, we have about five or seven minutes of uh, comment and so forth. So, hang around here. Uh, I may need to pass this to you because there's a hand going up. Control it. <laughs> but the research is all over the world. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, hi, uh, my name is James, and uh, I'm a student at the University of East Anglia studying meteorology and oceanography. Um, and in your language, I am learning FA. That's what I'm learning the last two days. Any chance to have some work experience at some stage? <laughs> well, we'd be very happy to give an actual thing that we can But we did have a meeting there uh, organised by um, the rainfall uh, people, and we held it in the university and invited you 
right to the department to try and nobody showed up. Well, actually, no, I'll tell you right. The staff didn't show up, so the students came in sort of secretly, so they weren't really there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is a serious question, though. We also be able to have proper discussion in every... every okay. Uh, I have a, a question for you. Uh, you talked about many, many impressive predictions you, you made, but, uh, well, don't take it back, but uh, that would be also of interest. Uh, Good morning, people. We were on, we're on the coffee break at the moment, nothing much is happening. But I was having tremendous problems with my 4G signal, which was absolutely perfect yesterday. So I wonder if someone is not wanting this information to get out. Um, I have now arranged to use the Conway Hall's own Wi-Fi. And I'm getting a rock-solid 100% signal for now. So until they work out to disrupt that, we can carry on, I think. So um, I will be back soon with the rest of the talks. Um, unfortunately, I missed quite large chunks of Piers Corbyn's talk. I'll have to try and catch him later and get him, see if I can get him to uh, to explain what he uh, what he wanted to me to say to me to you. Okay. Okay. We're just about due to restart. This is a very important part of the conference. Just have the morning tea break. I'm now on the Conway Hall building Wi-Fi, so my previous problems with the 4G hopefully should be behind me. Very mysterious. Rock solid signal all day yesterday. Very choppy waters this morning. Session within number four. First of all, I must say I think that Nicholas Warner has brought together an absolutely tremendous conference. The variety of speakers, the variety of, I think, well-founded scientific pieces related to the subject. Marcus, so congratulations, Nicholas. I'd also point out that I'm actually an economist, so although I've been interested in weather and climate change for over 60 years, uh, I would remind you that economists are also somewhat biotic on the subject. And I think you should all bear in mind the heavy and meaningful words of one Bill Nordhouse. Our future lies not in our stars, <coughs> but in our models. Well, you can see how wrong even economists can be. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have our record up. Sir, who's standing right here, ready to kick off? Thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, outstanding climate conference for the invitation and the opportunity to give a talk on uh, the title Reconsidering Livestock and Agriculture's Role in Climate Change. Since its early origins, Mankind adapts to the prevailing climatic conditions from the Arctic to the tropical rainforest and copes fairly successfully with natural climate variability. It is very old wisdom that climate dictates farm management practices. Fairly new, however, is the idea that agricultural lives of husbandry and food consumption habits are forcing supposedly the climate to change. This idea spread across the globe when thousands of media reports picked up the central message of the famous FAO report Livestock from Shadow from 2006, which blamed domestic livestock of causing serious environmental hazards such as climate change through greenhouse gas emissions. Another report published in 2013 basically transmitted the same message, reduced, however, somewhat the livestock contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions from 18 to 14.5%. But dramatic figures of emission intensity 
still were maintained, particularly for South American pasture-based beef production. The Alamis messages launched by the FAO triggered political action. There was a public audience in the European Parliament in November 2009 about the topic less meat equals less heat. Wow. Wow. <laughs> this was also a topic at the climate conference in Paris, COP21, in December of last year. Even in scientific literature, the reduction of livestock numbers and meat consumption was recommended. Is global climate really at risk from livestock husbandry and agriculture? <coughs> to answer this question, we first have to ask, does human activity rule the climate? The basic assumption for human-caused climate change is noticeable climate sensitivity to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, which is claimed with growing confidence by the IPCC assessment reports. This is surprising as there is growing empirical evidence which casts considerable doubt on this kind of conclusions. There is a growing divergence between observed and modeled temperatures. So far, IPCC projections never have been successfully validated. Critical scientists are not surprised of this reality. In the fourth IPCC assessment report, 16 variables were identified as global warming forcing agents and used for modeling. The level of understanding of 11 of them is specified as low to very low. Under such premises, <laughs> reliable modeling is impossible. Yet the IPCC comes up with a 90 to 95 percent certainty that human activity has been the main single driver of the slight warming observed during the past century. <laughs> Published estimates of climate sensitivity to CO2 are in rapid decline as, uh, since the turn of the millennium. And I'm happy that the author of this graph is among us, and we have seen this uh, graph already earlier this morning. The logical implication of this finding is that in the past, the model systematically exaggerated temperature projections into the future. Furthermore, when looking into the past, a growing number of peer-reviewed papers give evidence of pronounced warm periods during the Holocene, in spite of the pre-industrial atmospheric CO2 levels in those times. Gerbert Patzelt from Innsbruck University recovered ancient tree trunks conserved in moors and glaciers well above the present day tree lines all across the Alps. He concluded that in 65% of the Holocene, summer temperatures have been warmer than today. Other studies from stalagmites gave similar results. Next. Just as did ice core analysis from Greenland and from the Antarctica. In summary, there is room for considerable doubt on the need of anthropogenic emissions of natural greenhouse gases for the explanation of climate change. But even if we ignore these objections and keep assuming considerable climate sensitivity to greenhouse gas emissions, many inconsistencies still remain between the empirical reality and the claim of agriculture and livestock <coughs> driving climate change. <clears throat> CO2 emitted by human consumption of cereals, meat and milk, by livestock respiration and forage digestion does not increase atmospheric CO2 levels, as this is part of the natural carbon cycle. Not a single yeah. human or livestock born CO2 molecule is added additionally to the atmosphere um, as it, is, it has been captured previously by photosynthesis. 
the amount of CO2 released annually by humans and livestock is offset by regrowing CO2 assimilating forages and crops. The only additional CO2 sources uh, caused by agriculture and livestock husbandry beyond the natural carbon cycle are fossil fuel consumption during production, processing and marketing, such as transportation, soil tillage, harvesting and fertilizer <coughs> manufacturing, deforestation for pasture and cropping, or soil organic matter decomposition from degraded grasslands and arable lands. Usage of fossil fuels is much higher in industrial production systems which rely on forage cropping and feed transportation to the confined animals. In grazing systems, fuel consumption is rather low, as shown by these figures. In spite of ongoing deforestation, vole vegetation <coughs> cover has improved in the past 30 years due to rising CO2 as this satellite image-based analysis by CSRO Australia has shown. <laughs> Another study of 32 authors from 24 institutions from eight countries published on the NASA website found a significant increase in the leaf area index on most of the Earth's vegetated surface during the past 35 years, for which increasing CO2 emissions are considered responsible at a 70% level. Former IPCC author and reviewer Indra Boklani published this report in which he estimates the global fertilization value of man-made CO2 in the atmosphere to 140 billion US dollars every year. There are dozens of studies corroborating the efficiency of CO2 as a fertilizer of our crops, pastures and forests. Nevertheless, according to what I heard at the courts in Lima and in Paris, <coughs> you have programs, for example, the initiative T, the economy of ecosystems and biodiversity for agriculture and food, categorically ignore the beneficial effects of CO2 emissions in their economic assessments. The omission of such kind of obvious and important factors is sort of scientific bias. During most of the geological eras, atmospheric CO2 concentrations were higher than today. At the last glaciation maximum, 18,000 years ago, CO2 reached 180 ppm, low enough to stunt plant growth. That's why a considerable number of prominent scientists celebrate the re circulation of CO2 by fossil fuel burning to secure long-time survival of life on Earth. Taking into account that CO2 is essential nutrient for life, <laughs> is the only carbon source for all biomass, is fertilizing our crops and pastures and greening our deserts <laughs> as it improves water use efficiency and therefore drought resistance of plants, this trace compound in the air qualifies for being the most important, however limiting, nutrient of life. It is not the air pollutant as which it is seemingly exposed in the media with pictures like these. What we see here is water vapor and brine. CO2 is a transparent and odorless trace gas of which we are perspiring 500 liters every day. Other agricultural greenhouse gases such as methane and nitrous oxide also form part of natural cycles such uh, just like uh, CO2. There is however some confusion in the quantification of, man -made, of the man-made part of their emissions. The IPCC guidelines on national greenhouse gas inventories 
meticulously provide instructions, emission factors and formulas how to estimate the emissions from the various sources in managed ecosystems. Emissions from pristine or native ecosystems are explicitly not taken into account as they are not man-made. However, all managed agro-ecosystems replaced native ecosystems at some stage in history, which also have been sources of considerable mesoindigenous oxide emissions. In order to get the effective man-made part of the emissions from managed ecosystems, one has to subtract the baseline emissions from the respective native ecosystems or the pre-climate change managed ecosystems from those of the <coughs> agro-ecosystems. Omitting this correction leads to a systematic overestimation of farm-borne non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions. To my knowledge, not a single relevant scientific publication takes this consideration into account as farm-borne methane and nitrous oxide emissions are consistently interpreted at a 100% level as an additional anthropogenic greenhouse gas source just like fossil fuel borne CO2. As mentioned in the IPCC guidelines, the mentioned IPCC the guidelines are taken for the ultimate reference. These severe methodological deficiencies propagated undetected hundredfold through scientific literature. No doubt, temporarily waterlogged or flooded pristine ecosystems, or those with a high density of wild pangolins, might have emitted the same amount or even more methane per hectare per year than they did after land reclamation and utilization. So net anthropogenic methane emissions from certain agroecosystems could be zero or even assume a negative value. The same applies to nitrous oxide, particularly in farming systems where no or little synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is used. Ecosystem management and herbage consumption by livestock might increase somewhat the turnover rate of nitrogen, but does not increase the quantity of nitrogen in circulation from which nitrous oxide is emitted as a byproduct from nitrification and denitrification. Dung patches concentrate the nitrogen ingested from places scattered across the pasture. This study found no significant <coughs> differences between emissions factors from the patches and the rest of the pasture, which means the same amount of nitrous oxide is emitted whether or not the herbage passes livestock's intestines. However, the IPCC and FAO do consider all nitrous oxide leaking from manure as livestock born and therefore man-made. <laughs> Comparing, for instance, sown grassland with native bushland, which contains many leguminous species, it becomes evident that nitrogen stocks are higher and more nitrogen is circulated annually in native bushland than in grassland. <coughs> Therefore, in spite of the presence of grazing animals in grasslands, there is likely more nitrous oxide produced from bushland than from grassland after bush clearing and pasture establishment. And instead of charging the emission intensity of South American beef with 23 kilos of CO2 equivalents per kilo of carcass weight for nitrous oxide emissions from animal feces, there should rather be a negative value when it corrected for the emissions from the respective pre-land-use pristine ecosystems. Similar thoughts can be made for the enteric fermentation and deforestation part of emission intensity charges. This is the annual change of atmospheric methane concentration in the past thousand years as determined by ice core analysis and direct measurements. The rise of methane 
the missions beginning around 1850 coincides <coughs> perfectly with the progressive views of Marcel Dimitri that the lethal growth rate fell to zero at the turn of the millennium. Uh, the stabilization. Next. Next one, the stabilization of Mitha and emissions in the 1990s is very likely associated with the adoption of modern technology in fossil fuel production and use, particularly the replacement of leaking pipelines in the form of Soviet Union. Between 1990 and 2005, the world <coughs> cattle population rose by more than 100 million head of cattle, according to FAO statistics. During this time, between these arrows, atmospheric methane concentration stabilized completely. These empirical observations show that livestock is not a significant player in the global methane budget. Next slide. Okay. Okay. These maps show the global distribution of average methane concentrations measured by satellite and the geographical distribution of domestic animal density, respectively. There is no discernible relationship between both criteria. There are regions with high livestock <coughs> density and high methane emissions, China. There are regions with high life intensity and low methane concentrations, southern cone of Latin America. There are regions with very high life intensity and medium methane concentrations, India. And there are regions with extremely low life intensity and high methane emissions, such as Amazonia and Siberia. So, the idea of a considerable livestock contribution <coughs> to global methane emissions relies on theoretical bottom-up calculations. These photos show some measurement Oh dear. <laughs> emissions per animal are measured and multiplied by the number of animals, that's it. That's lovely job that is. interactions and baselines over time and space are generally ignored. In conclusion, basic scientific principles in quantifying CO2 greenhouse gas emissions from agroecosystems uh, have been violated by the IPCC. This leads to a tremendous overestimation of the potential contribution to climate change, even more so as the warming potential of anthropogenic greenhouse gases has very likely been systematically exaggerated. However, these important methodological deficiencies have been inexorably propagated through scientific literature. Just recently, a few rebuttals have been published. Thank you very much for your time. No, no, we take questions at the end. Question at the end. It's very real and very frightening to a small child. 
especially when the iceberg fell on the reporter in the small craft off the coast of Florida. Uh, I've had nightmares about that ever since. So I'm not looking forward to the little ice age. Um, the wonderful seminal event was being given a book, The Wonderful World of Volcanoes and Earthquakes, in the third grade. Now, in addition to Ice Age fears, I had a fear of pyroclastic flows engulfing eastern Pennsylvania. <laughs> this child was destined for a life immersed in earth sciences. Ah, yes. <laughs> The global warming crisis and HEW remind me of the evolution wars. The late Steve Gould bemoaned the fact that we all, as scientists, simply could not understand how such ignorance could prevail. Thus, we did nothing to stop it until it was too late. We now have a theme park in Kentucky that purports to duplicate exactly Noah's Ark, complete with unicorns. And they must have killed them all because we don't have any now. We have a creationist science being taught in schools and a creation museum with dioramas uh, depicting humans and dinosaurs coexisting at the same time. Shades of Aliyu and Fred Flintstone. By not standing up sooner to Al Gore's inconvenient truth and Mikey Mann's hockey stick, Perhaps we missed our chance to stop the madness. Or maybe it was the unexpected way that HEW was embraced by the scientifically ignorant public. Many humans seem unable to remember what the weather was like when they were children and choose to disbelieve tales told by their grandparents. Before we realized it, data was being manipulated, changed, and politicized to support the IPCC models. Overnight, the Little Ice Age, the medieval warming period, the modern minimum became myths, banned from Wikipedia. The majority of people simply don't understand that we are living between glaciations and the ice will come back. But more importantly, they fail to understand that our Earth has been much warmer in historic times, but also much colder. Between the unfair tactics of the extremists and the involvement of politicians, it became nearly impossible to push back against the police. <coughs> don't run a tour or we'll run out. These same people don't seem to understand the difference between climate and weather. And despite years of talking about the weather and knowing they can't change it, actually believe <coughs> humans are capable of altering the climate. Would it were so, I would then stop worrying about the strong potential for another little ice age in my lifetime. How have environmental extremists, apparently ignorant of basic science, managed to convince the world that carbon dioxide is a pollutant and it's all our fault? Thanks entirely to the self-declared climate scientists, we are constantly bombarded with nonsense. The hottest summer ever, the warmest winter ever, the mythical major storms that are on the increase, the acidification of the world's oceans, dying coral reefs, sinking islands, rising sea level that is soon to inundate all low-lying coastal areas. But can anyone point to anywhere in the world where any of these things have actually happened? The answer is that they occur only in the climate models created and promoted by people who appear to never have done any actual field work. Had any of the climate scientists ever left their computer labs and gone out to take some measurements of real life events or bothered to examine Earth's climate history, they would not be making these outlandish claims. But then they would not be receiving the lucrative grant money that supports their research. Nearly daily, new and outrageous claims are published by the climate scientists who insist they have just made a remarkable new discovery while fiddling their models. The ice in the Arctic and Antarctic is melting, surging, thinning, and this will cause sea level to rise three meters, at least. Yeah, probably 
more like 120. Some ice lavenders discovered a way to turn carbon dioxide into carbonate rocks, locking the nasty pollutant up tight. A recent paper in the formerly respect, respected journal Nature <laughs> insists that humans have been causing AGW since 1830. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's a real... <laughs> that, and this accounts for um, remarkable warming at the end of the Little Ice Age, which they claim didn't exist anyway, so that couldn't have happened. These papers corner the market on weasel words, like if, maybe, possibly, with further study, could happen, might, we expect, and so on. But there is hope that the tide is finally turning. Climate gate, the failed WECO attempt by some attorneys general, the utter failure of sea level rise to inundate Miami, London, and assorted archipelagos around the world. This has caused non-scientists to begin to question the predictions and the much heralded threats. With none of the IPCC predictions coming true, it is harder and harder to sell the AGW can't. Currently, the search for Pokemon is a lot more interesting <laughs> to people than uh, what's happening with AGW. So as the Sahara shrinks and harvests increase thanks to the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more and more people are ignoring the predicted dire threats. The lack of an active hurricane season on the east coast of the USA, contrary to the predictions of huge storms in the offing, is yet another crack in the HW armor. But failed predictions of catastrophe have not deterred the true believers. Much like the diehard evolution deniers, they will most likely go to their graves insisting they are right and just wait, we will fry or drown or be blown away any day now. One must keep the faith. This would not be a problem had not governments around the world sensed a chance for advancing their own agendas and jumped into the AGW discussion with both feet. Millions have been thrown at trying to rid the world of a dangerous pollutant, CO2. This despite the fact that the gas of life is essential to plant growth and our continued existence as a species. The paltry 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide we currently enjoy is nearly the lowest it has ever been. Efforts to reduce this essential gas completely ignore the fact that below 180 parts per million, plant life ceases to flourish. And without plant life, we critters are toast. In my opinion, climate scientists were all absent in grade school the day the carbon cycle was explained. Now, carbon dioxide is considered a pollutant by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. <laughs> and this stance was upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States. Nine justices with not a snitch of science among them. We have countries and municipalities falling over each other to build expensive and inefficient wind and solar farms. Um, I lost my place, sorry. <laughs> Corn, formerly considered a food crop, is now being turned into biogas. In and in a process that uses nearly as much energy as it produces. And the, diesel, the biodiesel is not as good as good old fossil fuel diesel. So it's less efficient. This alone should make us reconsider ethanol if the immoral practice of burning fuel for power doesn't bother you. I hope I said food. Burning food for power. However, there is good news. Support for wind and solar farms is weakening in the face of power poverty. People are starting to complain about having to choose between putting food on the table or being able to turn on the lights. Countries and states that rely solely on renewable energy sources are, are charging three to four times as much for power as those that rely on natural gas and coal-fired plants. New York State has decided to give nuclear and energy another try. 
Well, after all, it does not generate dreaded carbon dioxide. We are seeing more and more pushback against governments that want to waste money on tilting at the windmills of AGW. The world is getting out. The word is getting out. The world is not going to burn up. The poles are not melting, and carbon dioxide is most certainly not a pollutant. Now, in the uh, week since I wrote this talk, there were a few interesting uh, happenings. So, uh, Ban Ki-moon, outgoing UN Secretary General, declared that the climate debate is over. Science is settled in his mind, and that should silence anyone who questions the IPCC reports and summaries for policymakers. So, he's handed down the word we all have to bow to that, I suppose. The Huffington Post has declared that the decision by Australia to cut funding for arena renewables programs is an existential threat to green innovation. Existential is pretty much a word that you can take out and sentence still makes sense, but that's a scary word. Most recently, we were told that it is immoral to slash green budgets to try and contain the spiraling Aussie government debt. Better to spend billions on inefficient windmills and solar panels than refuse to cut carbon pollution. This means our children and grandchildren will have to pay for our meanness. More likely, our children and grandchildren will be thanking us for encouraging the use of reliable ways to keep the grid up. U.S. President Obama has convinced the Chinese that if both nations sign on to the Paris Accords, the Earth won't perish from climate change. Hmm. What he has failed to tell the Chinese is that he alone cannot ratify any treaties. All treaties must be approved by the Republican-controlled Congress, and they are disinclined to put their stamp of approval on any outlandish schemes to throw money at non-existent devils. In an attempt to convince people that we are the hottest summer ever, NOAA started using a new icon on their national weather feed. This is something a lot of us get up on our computers. If the temperature is predicted to reach or exceed 90 Fahrenheit, 32 centigrade, they put up a large sun in an orange-yellow sky over a city skyline. In southern Virginia, 90, 32 is the summer, in the summer months, is through September is not unusual. Rather, it is the norm. In the summer, we expect to be warm in the south. But a frightening image of the sky on fire serves their purposes in trying to make people believe we are experiencing unnaturally hot days. And humans have very short memories. But to my mind, the most egregious example of a triple whammy was the mainstream media in collusion with NOAA and the National Hurricane Center. Tropical Storm Hermione was declared a Category 1 hurricane while sustained winds were still below 74 miles per hour. The maximum sustained wind speed never exceeded 65 miles per hour, so it was a tropical storm. Evacuation of the Gulf Coast of Florida was encouraged and mandated by Florida Governor Jim Scott. This, despite the fact that this storm never even achieved hurricane force, he described her mind as a killer storm, extremely dangerous and a threat to life. After her mind crossed over to the Atlantic and continued moving northeast along the coast, Georgia, South, and North Carolina, and Virginia kept up the warnings of extreme danger from the Labor Day weekend killer storm. I think somebody did die in Florida. So, killer storm. But they probably drowned in their bathtub. <laughs> it, was, it was nothing of the sort, and in retaliation, beach resorts were shouting that no one should cancel plans to spend the weekend at the beach. They were sending out announcements of clear and sunny weather. It was peculiar indeed to see on the same newscast such contradictory weather information. Noah was still insisting her mind was dangerous and life-threatening in weather resorts, well, weather reports, while elsewhere in the news were video clips of people frolicking in the sun and surf and just having a wonderful weekend. 
To my recollection, this is the first time National Weather was warning us about rip currents and advising people not to swim or surf. NOAA and the National Weather Service has adopted a brand new shiny weather forecasting model. If this is how it works, maybe they should have waited until it was out of date. Hmm. Has it been all the way through yet? Ah, that's the last one. Okay. <laughs> that, those are my cows. <laughs> the events occurring between the 29th of August and the 5th of September should have made it obvious to anyone paying attention that there is something very wrong with the IPCC party line. But how many people actually pay attention? Not many, I fear.
Popularization books flourished in booksellers' shops. Inspired scenario writers used the new theory to imagine scary end-of-the-world stories. A new chapter was, was rising, new questions were asked. No one could remain indifferent. Then, some discordant opinions started to raise soon. Since the very beginning, some searchers were already skeptical, but quickly, any skepticism was regarded as a sin, since it could stop the momentum for questions which could help mankind to make significant progress in its humanity. <coughs> Thus, only a few people ever heard the names of such skeptical searchers. And since, as usual, the newspapers were more willing to report exciting announcements than skeptical arguments, <coughs> also suggesting that the competence of those skeptics were, was doubtful, the consensus appeared to be real for the vast majority of the people. The consensus was strongly uh, back, please, back. The consensus was strongly supported by an American man, formerly diplomats, who spent most of his life in successful conference on the issue. He became a living symbol. Several scientists were with him. One of them is still known today for its use of tender chronology to study past traitors of the earth. Sorry? Already heard that before. <laughs> Shame. Shame. Yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to lose your time. With the things you already know, so let me go faster. Sorry for that. So, well, even if newspapers did not report it, skeptics had three major reasons to challenge the theory. First, it was a priori strange that so many and so precise results could be uh, derived from an object so difficult to investigate. Second, complementary atmospheric analysis were impossible to reconcile with the theory. Third, several analyses that seemed initially the best support to the theory were nothing more than artifacts. As time went, more and more defaults in the theory were discovered. All its arguments, from the simplest to the most subtle, appear for what they were in reality empty shells. So, several years after the first announcements, the glorious story was done. Some people never allowed that the skeptics were right, so the story did definitely end only one century after its beginning. The coup de grace was given in July the 20th. 1976. At that date, the American spacecraft Viking 1 landed on Mars, definitely proving that no life ever arose on that planet. Sorry? All things considered, the story I'm, not, I'm telling you is not the one you expected, so probably I could explain it better. At the end of the 19th century, Propitious astronomical configurations made especially easy the observation of Mars, allowing the astronomer to make its cartography. <coughs> and, <that's exactly. coughs> and a strange phenomenon was then reported. Uh, several straight lines seemed to appear all over the surface of the planet. These lines were too straight to be natural. So the idea arose that these canals was a, were an undoubtable sign of the existence of a living civilization on Mars. The amazing size of the canals uh, was a proof that the Martian civilization was extremely advanced. <coughs> In comparison, the Suez and Panama canals, contemporary of the story of the canals of Mars, were just ridiculous. The canals of Mars were not born from the imagination of some joker. Its first observer was Giovanni Chaparelli, a respected scientist director of the Milano Observatory. Thus, it was not surprising that many scientists decided to take this observation in consideration. But why did the Martians build such enormous canals? The answer was given by Percival Lovell. Next slide, please. So the left button. <laughs> Percival Lovell, who resigned his position of diplomat to become an amateur astronomer, 
He built a top modern observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, to study in detail the canal of Mars. And his conclusions were dramatic. Martians have built their canals to preserve their planet from a global drought caused by a global climate change. <laughs> the union of all the Martian civilizations was necessary to build those canals, which allowed to transport water from the poles and irrigate the whole planet. How fantastic was this unified Martian civilization! Undoubtedly, this civilization gave us a wonderful example of solidarity. Those who have seen Albert's climate alarmist uh, movie, An Inconvenient Truth, will e easily recognize the very same sentimentality, the main difference between the planets, supposedly, the team of major climate change. Lawal can hardly be regarded as a philanthropist with a, with a patient for astronomy. His authoritarian behavior is well established. For example, he forced some of his employees to support his affirmation that canals were also present on the surface of Venus. One of his employees was Andrew Douglas, eventually fired because of his dance. And as a funny fact, uh, Douglas was also the main founder of Denver Chronology. <laughs> that recently gave rise to the infamous legacy chart, not regarded as a conclusive proof of my main global warming ah. on, on Earth. So now, <coughs> let's be clear. The fact that there are no canals on Mars does not disprove the anthropogenic global warming theory. What I've made here is nothing more than an analogy. It is not intended to prove anything. Its only meaning is to stimulate thinking. Yes, scientists sometimes make mistakes. Yes, their personal beliefs can sometimes alter their views. And when science and moral are mixed up, when confusion appears between science and politics or philosophy of life, then science loses it. At the time of the Canal of Mars, the world was full of mechanization, engineering, and modernity. That is, the idea that, as said Descartes, we would someday become masters and processors of nature. Now we live in postmodernity. We consider that we possess the world, but that we are unworthy of our contemporaries. <coughs> At this for a part, it is this general philosophy of life shared by so many intellectuals that explains why the doubtful theory of anthropogenic global warming could gain so many success. The idea that our planet is a living body, some kind of a goddess who asks for repentance and suddenness, makes some climate alarmists, not all of them, of course, example of postmodern pseudoscientists. As I see it, the climate affair is the newest avatar of what I call the exponential fear. The fear that humanity... Next one, please. The fear that humanity is growing exponential fast, in the mathematical sense of the word, and that the world is fundamentally finite, so we will soon crash into our ultimate limits. To illustrate the point, let me quote James Hansen, that you know, of course. In 2007, he wrote in a peer review article following about the about melting ice. He wrote melting, that melting ice was small until the past few years, but it has at least doubled in the past decade and is now close to one millimeter per year. As a quantitative example, let us say that the ice sheet contribution is one centimeter for the decade 2005-2015, and that it doubles each decade until the Western Antarctic ice sheet is largely depleted. This time constant yields a sea level rise of the order of five meters this century. With an exponential, you can do it, forecast any, any catastrophe. So, in a sense, the climate fear is the newest avatar of the irrational exponential fear. It is not the first one, and it is probably not the last. Hence, we should be concerned by the fact that sooner or later it will be replaced by another one, possibly the Anthropocene. So, maybe we are able to prevent its emergence. Thank you for attention.
is going down too. Next slide, please. This is temperature versus CO2. Same effect. Temperature goes up. CO2, actually, the uh, tornado uh, activity goes down. Yeah. Inverse correlation again, but not causation. Next slide, please. This is precipitation, all right? Precipitation is one of the big bugaboos of global warming. This is a 100-year period. <coughs> precipitation flat. What's up with that provided me with this graphic? No change in precipitation over 100 years. Next slide, please. Uh, this is what you kind of find the EPA. There's lots of blue screws. Yeah. All right, now, no, let me tell you why. This next slide, please. This is uh, Brittany in France. You can see part of England here. These are contrails, jet contrails. They do affect climate. They do affect weather, all right? How do they affect weather? Well, first of all, you have an albedo effect with the contrails. Sunlight hitting them gets reflected at wavelengths that CO2 does not intercept, all right? So contrails <clears throat> make sure that the surface is slightly cooler. After 9-1-1, for four days, no planes flew. No planes. Temperature records showed that highs were higher and lows, nighttime lows were lower. Why? Because without the jet contrails, more sunlight hit the surface, converted to infrared, warmed the atmosphere so the daytime highs were higher. Without the contrails, re-radiating heat at night, the nighttime lows radiated more into the atmosphere and were lower too. So you had a dampening effect of contrails, which was made very clear during those four, that four-day period. Now, we still have contrails. Why would EPA spend a nickel on something that would actually ameliorate or dampen weather effects? We're always talking about extremes and being real bad. Well, they're not going to be bad if they <coughs> regulate the aircraft emissions. Next slide, please. Can I talk about the decision process on I, I apologize to the chiefs, they don't deserve this. <laughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> right. Now we're going to talk about sea level rise. Here we have a, a <coughs> 20,000 year look at sea level rise. There's some pulses here. This is most likely the emptying of Lake Bonneville in the United States. And there are a couple of other pulses. Tahiti may be falling off its plume because some of these measurements were taken in Tahiti. You can see a little blue dash. And this is the, this little subset here, this is the last 8,000 years. Basically, once all the ice melted, in fact, you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. The ice melted literally over a 7,000 year period. Started out here, but really from here on in, this is where the ice really melted. I'm talking about the great giant glaciers that covered North America, covered Northern Europe, uh, depressed Norway, and, and you'll see that uh, quite, quite soon. And so, the ice is gone. We're not happy. There's no more ice to melt. So we've had sea levels are relatively flat out. There's a slight rise. Uh, the satellites, by the way, and in another talk of mine, if you go to my website, uh, you can see where I talk about the uh, frailty of satellite instrumentation. And that's a long lecture. I'm not going to even start here. But the satellites show a 3.3 millimeter uh, a year rise. You don't see that kind of rise. Al Gore, excuse me, Jim Hansen, says that we're going to see this much rise, five meters, by the end of the century, uh, right? <clears throat> we're going to be inventing new laws of physics to make this happen. <laughs> and we'll talk about that later. Okay, next slide, please. This is how we measure sea level, real measurements of sea level. We take a tide gauge, it's anchored to the bedrock, and we measure it. And we have good, hard data showing how this is measured. Next slide, please. Okay, I borrowed the slide uh, from Nielsen, and uh, there's a couple of, a couple of others, uh, Nicholas, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a bias in tide gauges. First of all, that 3.3 millimeter that Noah says, most of the tide gauges are below it. This is worldwide. Next slide, please. This shows you the bias in, in, in tide gauges. Why? People put tide gauges where, quote, sea level is rising or their land is sinking. So you're taking tectonics into effect here. So here are the places where sea level is, quote, falling. Why? Because land is, is, is rising. And uh, here you have subsidence. 
and many, many more time periods. So if you take the average of all of these, of course it's going to show zero. It's really rising. Next slide, please. This is, again, uh, compliments of uh, our, our chair here. It shows the tectonics involved in uh, isostasy, which is you put a, a couple of miles or kilometers worth of ice, it depresses the land, it bulges at the edges, and these are meters, and it also depresses things down here into the asthenosphere. Uh, <clears throat> when this ice melts, <coughs> it popped up a rebound. Next slide, please. These are tectonics in the Baltic. Uh, notice central Norway and Sweden, where most of the weight of the ice was, has rebounded enormously, 800 meters up here. By the way, these lines, they're equivalent to what we in meteorology use as isobars and isotherms. Uh, I call these isotets. They are places where tectonics are equal. And you have down here an area here where tectonics are basically balanced out. Down here in Holland, you see that the land is sinking. Again, as a result of the weight being removed from Norway, the, the ice is now in the oceans. Water is heavy. Cubic meter is one ton. You put all those tons in the ocean, it depresses the ocean basin. And so Holland is kind of sinking, but right here in the Mecklenburg bend of the Baltic, we have a place called uh, Whisper, Whisper, Germany. Next slide, please. Now, Whisper has a good 100. Uh, <coughs> Going back to 1850, you have a good long-term record of sea level rise. In this same period, CO2 has gone up 38%. Do you see any signal whatsoever in the sea level here showing a 38% acceleration? Is sea level rise affected by CO2? Well, if you can see it, you're pretty good. I can't. Let me, let me go to another place here. Uh, tectonic meter, next slide, please. This is Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine uh, is on the Gulf of Maine. It is also tectonically inert. Here you see uh, a slightly shorter period, and you see why it sp uh, spreads here. Why? Because the tide range in Portland, Maine is over three meters every day. Right? There are a lot of wide ranges. However, I'm pretty good at curve fitting. If you looked at my bio, you probably figured that out. This is still a linear rise. And it's 125 millimeters per century. The last 25 years in Portland, Maine, the sea level has risen exactly 5 millimeters. Now, if you can do pretty well, if you do math, you can figure out that that is 2 centimeters for 100 years. The last 25 years, OK? Next slide, please. This is what the American National Climate Assessment puts out. The lowest value for sea level rise is the low value is two centi two, uh, 20 centimeters. The 100 year rate that is presently being experienced is one tenth of that, one order of magnitude less. This is where you're going to have to invent new laws of physics to get six feet, which is two meters of sea level rise, in the remaining 84 years of this century. It just doesn't happen. And there is no ice left to do it. Antarctica is actually gaining ice. 0.23 millimeters a year gain or reduction in sea level rise just due to Antarctica alone. The edges of Greenland are melting. I don't have a problem with that but the interior is also gaining. There is no way that we can get this kind of sea level <coughs> in the next 84 years, when right now, we aren't even achieving this. Okay, next slide, please. Now, this is the Paris proposals, okay? We're gonna reduce CO2 worldwide, that's the, the big agreement. If we have a 38% increase in sea level rise, uh, excuse me, in CO2, that is not detectable, how will a 1% or 2% reduction ever be measured? That's it. We, we don't even have an instrument that can measure that. If we can't measure a signal of 38% in this line right here, forget the Paris proposals. And the disasters that most people are talking about are sea level rise. It just isn't going to happen. Okay. Next slide, please. 
This is the real future of New York City, a much better picture than you saw before. Abundant energy, sea level has not changed, and uh, this is the world the way it should be. Next slide, please. Two minutes. Okay, this is really good. Thank you, sir. Because this is my conclusion. See what I can say to you. Is there a cause and effect? I'm going to scream out the answer. No. Does a rise and fall in one increase or decrease the other? Absolutely not. Next slide, please. How about weather? Weather events, cause and effect. Not really what you think, not really what you've heard. Correlation is not causation. Even inverse correlation is not causation. We have to actually get into the physics behind things to find out why they happen. And that is not happening with the IPCC. Next, please. This is what's really of concern and where research dollars need to be spent. People here have talked about an 11-year sunspot cycle. It really is a 22-year cycle, folks, because the magnetic field of the sun flips at the peaks and then reflips 22 years later. So it's uh, 22 years, not 11. However, the peaks are at 11-year intervals. These are the last three. Notice the direction. Something more serious is happening here, too. The length between them is increasing. It's not really 11.22 anymore. It seems to be 12.24. If the level, the length of time is increasing, the intensity of sunspots is actually decreasing. If we go to the next slide, this is now way before. Can you go to the back of the slide again? Right here is where we are today. We're not down at the bottom. But take a look at the, at the last two months. This is very recent data. Now you can go to the next slide. Blank. No sunspots. No. We're not supposed to see that. And yet that's current right now as we speak. My good friend Willie really Soon, solar uh, expert uh, extraordinaire, was uh, brutally, brutally manhandled by the press earlier this year for absolutely false accusations. And you're the greatest solar expert on the planet being pulled out of circulation for a few months while this stuff is going on. <coughs> this is what people need to understand. So they have to, you know, put their research in. Next slide, please. At NASA, when you give a presentation, this slide pops up, all right? In God we trust all others bring data. You can see, for me, you see data. Next slide, please. Notice the sort of truth is up here now, no, that's it. I'd like this, this group to take this as a model. And God we trust all others bring data. I have presented data, thank you, use it well. Questions, <laughs> maybe a direct question to a net name speaker, and then... It's the questions. thing here. You notice I use a pretty decent laser to illuminate my slides. All right? I made a mistake once in a former presentation of lending my little laser pointer to someone else. By the time it came to me, he had drained the batteries. Okay? So that's why I didn't give him the batteries. But Nils, uh, Nicholas, come over here. This is your gift for future presentations. <laughs> various presentations, it's occurred to me that occasionally a killer slide's come up. Sometimes um, a speaker has actually concentrated on that, other times it's just gone, that's it. It'd be nice to pull some of these key slides out. Now, but, um, I can't remember, is it Mr. Blatson? Oh, yeah. um, you had a key slide, you just flashed it through. It was the one, I'm not sure we bring it up, but it was um, the ice cores from one of the West Antarctica things with carbon dioxide at temperature. And um, it's the sort of thing that Al Gore showed us on a much more sort of extended time scale, so that, that the, the graphs were more or less coincident. 
And he said, look, uh, carbon dioxide goes up and the temperature goes up. So he wanted to indicate that the cause of the temperature increase was carbon dioxide. Now, you showed it at a uh, much more detailed level in a thousand of years, and you could see very clearly that the temperature moved first, and then 800 years after one average, uh, the, the carbon dioxide moved. That's a key slide. Um, that's the sort of thing I mean, and maybe others have got those, and it'd be, it'd be nice to collect some of those together, because in terms of the arguments against, by the way, it's not called ATW anymore, they had to move to climate change, because clearly that wasn't working. Um, so, in fighting the, the sort of the, the notions within, half a dozen notions within the ATW hypotheses, uh, that is one of the key slides, and maybe there are others. There are others from the cyclicities that we talked about yesterday. It would be nice to gather some of these together. Anyway, yeah, it's just a comment. Okay, By the way, that's an ex excellent comment. So, in the other, because I can send that slide, the Boston Ice Core slide, you clearly show that the temperature is uh, preceding the carbon dioxide in both directions. Send me an email, ask for a Vostok slide, and you won't get it. It's the the coldersign.com. It is the combination of these things. If you have that slide where you see the raw data and D appears, now it's about you. Because then you go to his graph where you saw that the CO2 is coming out of it, not the opposite. That is the way of you, how you combine it. And then we combine it with all the thing we said the first day about the sun. Yes, maybe that is something we should be doing. It takes some little exercise. Yeah, but it's very excellent. Nicholas, can I perhaps I can make my point here, um, which I think could, could be discussed. Um, for our more general discussion later on this afternoon, we've seen so many slides that are really important that are not in the extended uh, summaries. Yeah. I mean, for Thomas here, uh, can I just say something about two that? slides that have many more useful ones, and that goes for many of our speakers, and it would be great. I don't know, Nicholas, whether you intend to make a full book of all this, but it would be a pity if many of the slides that we haven't seen in, in the extended summaries, but have seen on the screen, could be made available. My uh, friend, we, 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 publish, we publish it in your year. Of course. All you need to do to get published, in my can, opinion, can I just yes. say, excuse me, hello, hello. We're going to put all of the PowerPoint presentations online at the GeoFix website, along with the extended abstracts, available, available for everybody to download. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, who was next? Who was the next? One, and then it was two and three. Very, must be depressed. I didn't see that. Sorry. We all know that if you spend too much time on the pub, your beer loses CO2. And I think it's pretty clear that one reasonable hypothesis is that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is simply a proxy for the temperature of the ocean. Did I Not much Did I My name is Yggdrasil Ekman. I happen to be the head of the climate realists of Norway, and I hope you noticed know, that large number of Norwegians uh, present here. for our organizations or paying their own private expenses fear and, uh, and living. Anyway, I would like to make a comment rather than a question concerning the uh, uh, greening of the Earth due to increased CO2. Every plant physiologist uh, worth his salt, and uh, accidentally I happen to be trained also as a plant physiologist, knows that we need more CO2 to boost the uh, photosynthesis seen from a plant perspective. And uh, those who try and bring confusion into this do not really represent the mainstream science of plant physiology. It's actually, for plant physiologists, a trivial fact that more CO2 is needed. We don't even call it mainstream science, but it is mainstream science. And if we expand this argument to get 
more CO2 back into circulation. Then there are several reasons for burning all the fossil fuel we can find. <laughs> because due to the argument that there is a natural balance of some ecological kind where all carbon is circulating, then all fossil fuels represent carbon that has been locked away from that uh, globally given circle. And that needs to be brought back. It's, it's very clear it's very clear that CO2 is a limiting plant nutrient and that's known since I don't know at least a hundred years actually. It's yes. not a new science but it recently has been uh, supported and confirmed by, um, uh, by publications which even appeared on the NASA website and the CSIRO website so I'm happy on that. They grow very good tomatoes at whiskey distilleries, I hear. With the excess CO2 from the fermentation, they have greenhouses and they grow wonderful tomatoes. They've done this for, for decades and decades and decades. You're right, you're right. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, the, the greenhouse gardeners are, are gassing their greenhouses with CO2 and get much more yield, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the idea. Right, it's Philip Foster here, slightly sort of flippant one, but on the uh, Get Outbreaks talk, that uh, the lovely Prince Charles here in England, <laughs> who keeps flocks of sheep down in Cornwall, has apparently for some years been feeding them on a special diet that reduces the methane emissions. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, and I rather not only refer to it as a low fat diet. <laughs> <laughs> cannot see any livestock signal, nor in the geographical distribution, nor in the historical de development of methane. I don't think there is any need of reducing methane in animals. Hello, um, yeah, my name is David Curtin and I'm a member of the London Assembly. Um, thank you for all your talks and uh, climate change... <laughs> 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 I wasn't expecting a clap, but thank you very much. Um, I, I, I've debated climate change uh, in, in many hustings and things, so it's something I'm learning about. Um, and, and thanks for your, your presentations. I was particularly interested in the sea level presentation, and, and your data on Wismar in Germany and, and Portland was quite clear. Um, when I've debated it, I've, I've, uh, people who, who believe in anthropogenic climate change and sea levels often cite uh, Kiribati and the Marshall Islands as examples of where the sea levels have risen greatly. And what would you say to, to those people as, as a counter argument? Well, first of all, some of those islands are sinking tectonically. <coughs> Others, in the Bikini area of the Pacific, have had 67 underground nuclear explosions Oops. shaking up coral <laughs> islands that these poor people live on. What do you think happens to coral when it gets uh, shifted, shifted like that? Uh, other places, they engage in something called bomblet fishing. They take a small little cherry bomb, throw it in the water, boom, it goes off. The fish kind of float up to the top, and they scoop them into the boat. It's illegal, but every one of those little bomblets shakes up the coral and helps make it sink. Now, it's illegal in most places, but the police who are monitoring it take their payment in fish, and they let them keep going. Uh, and other places are naturally sinking, but in tectonically inert places on the planet, there is a slow, steady, uh, temperature-induced, because the oceans are still slightly warming, a thermal expansion-driven sea level rise. It is linear. It is absolutely not affected by CO2. That's the message you need to take back to them. Stop a little bomb and fishing too. Not good. You can eat the fish, but you can't live on the, on, on the water. So. Okay, I will expand on that in this afternoon because there are more to say on this problem. You will have all the diagrams of Kiribati and, and it's not, not sinking, and, and, but the sea level is really stable there. And we come back also to these warming things, which it doesn't affect the coast. 
But the fact is, it was on landfill. They didn't build a landfill high enough. They are thinking about putting barriers around and protecting the subway infrastructure. But this was a man-made disaster because the landfill wasn't built high enough. The same way that New Orleans was a man-made disaster because the levee was only this thick, which finally broke after a hurricane, forced water upriver, and then it washed back down. So humans are responsible for some disasters, not the climate. Okay, next question. Next question. Yes, for, for, for Shimmer as well. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Okay, um, I'm not a professional academic, but just two comments really, uh, which either Pamela or Bernard might respond to, and one which Thomas might respond to. First is um, the question of why people believe it when they've sort of seized upon it. Um, and it, one of the ideas in my head is that people want to believe it because that way you've got a chance of doing something about it. On the assumption that temperatures are going up, you know, it's a big assumption, but just if that's true, if you feel you can do something about it, you feel you're in control. If it's a natural phenomena, you can't do anything about it, and people are frightened of that. So that's one comment for Pamela and Bedlar. For Thomas, on the question of um, measurability, as I understand it, um, even James Hansen's papers, when he comes to um, compare the fundamental difference between solar irradiation inbound and um, uh, suppose difference outbound, uh, even the, the most modern satellite instruments aren't able to measure any difference at all. Um, and they have to model that as well and come up with, with, with some number of the other, whichever suits the purpose, but it's actually immeasurable. Well, I, I would trust the RSS satellite meter better. I have problems with satellites. And like I said, you, in another paper, you can see satellite orbital degradation has a, is a big factor which isn't being uh, looked at. But the RSS satellite feeds show that the upper troposphere is relatively flat, even though you can find portions of the Earth that have warmed, and those are the records. By the way, that this whole CO2 thing is, in my uh, belief, taxation driven. The politicians would love to tax petrochemicals. Uh, and if they can convince the population that taxation of petrochemical companies will save the planet, they want the population to say, please tax us. And that's yeah. the thing that's behind it. It is a financial yep. driven, and they can you know, pay a couple of research dollars to, to some scientists and come up with the justification for that tax. And watch, that's exactly what's happening. So it's going at one o'clock. Hello, this is just a little test to see how this comes out on Twitter. Um, all I've found out all my morning's tweets have been mangled by link.is. I've just tried to get rid of that nasty thing from my account. Conference actually gets a few more viewers. Because this morning I've had hardly anybody, and I think maybe Link is has been putting them off. Okay. Welcome back to the afternoon session. Thank <laughs> you. 
and the grants are in blue. But you can see that there is some connection between this graph and the other one. Uh, in the north, because it goes from the north of the peninsula till the uh, Barcelona area, in the north you have tectonic movement, so you have ups and downs in the, the sea level trends. In the middle, which means more or less the Portuguese stations, you have uh, quite a normality of about one millimeter, one millimeter, uh, coma seven here in this area, and of course in the south, near the back of the Cordillera, you have a lot of changes. It means the relief is going up and down, and in the east, of course, you have very large trend. Um, but you must combine this, with, of course, with the number of years of the series. And so you see that here you have about uh, 25, more than 25 millimeters of trends per year, which is a stupid thing, but the number of years is very small. So the, the bigger the series, the more uh, uh, normal intercomers the, uh, the trends seem to be. This is the data available, that were available, they are available, they are not available anymore in this PS mean sea level in 2002. Okay. So, in Portugal, because erosion is quite dramatic sometimes, they say that sea level uh, is, um, is rising quite fast and many people even say that they, there is a sea level acceleration. Is it true? Okay, so I'll try, I'll try to, to, uh, to bring the new, the more actualized data. The permanent service for mid sea level stations uh, that are available in Google Earth, they show uh, green for actualized data and red for known actualized data. You see, these data with red are before 1998. So, unfortunately, almost all the stations in Portugal are very unactualized, which is a shame. And it's a shame mostly because they say we are a country of people that loves to see and navigate yeah. through the walls, a stupid thing. <laughs> but there are a lot of, of other stations in the Iberia, and so of course I use them. And with the data, all the data, even the non-actualized data, I made, I <coughs> calculated with the Excel uh, the, the trends, the new trends, and also I put the same thing, the years of the data, the years of the series. And uh, in the violet you have Cascais, which has the biggest series on the peninsula, another 12 years and also large in the south, in the Algarve, which has 91, and Cadiz, which has another nine years. So you can see that the longest series has not very big difference mm. in, in trends, okay? That is something I should like to emphasize. Of course, maybe you can make also a graph uh, with the series the shortest series, less than 25 years, they are very irregular, and the longest series that are here in violet, and the average of all this. And so you have two populations, really two populations of uh, uh, sea level data in the PSML. Here is another way to show this. <coughs> this is the average, Bonanza has the biggest trend, but it is for uh, and something millimeters per year. Uh, here you have big liquid cascais, 
here you have the sky, which is one millimeter, comma three, uh, more or less. And even Avey is near the port as a negative trend. So here the sea level is going down, at least according to the data, of course. Uh, analyzing a bit more uh, the sky data, they held in 1993, uh, I think, and uh, you can see there is a trend, of course, a trend of one millimeter, comma three, but it's much more interesting to see their ups and downs, ups and downs, like everywhere else in the world, I think. And we have talked about all these um, trends going up and down. Now, it appears a new service, Sea Level Station Monitoring <coughs> Facility, and here you have much more detailed data. Uh, the same thing happens. Most of the, the stations in Portugal are not well actualized. It's a shame. But uh, I, I will show you the kind of data you can get from this site. Uh, for, for instance, <coughs> which is an important place for Portugal because uh, the Caravelas flew out of there to make the discoveries. We have at the top notches and the start, we have every minute the uh, registration of sea level. And of course, you can get a curve like this for about a month. So it's very detailed data. But unfortunately, at Cascais, it ended a year ago. Okay? <laughs> There's no yeah. more at Cascais. So it stops here. Just here. I was trying to find new data, but I was not happy. With, uh, I was not uh, able to do it. Okay, but I asked them for the, the data. They were very kind. They sent me data of all the stations I asked for. And um, at the sky, I think it's every uh, second or something. They have data terribly, probably too much detailed. And with the data I got, is about two months. Uh, you, uh, don't, but you see the 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 the, the, the tides, and so we understand it is about two months to uh, new tides. Uh, oh, God, sometimes I don't really remember the words in <laughs> spring tides, new tides, and so making the mean of this calculating there are. Thousands and thousands of data. It's an Excel file with a lot of data. I can get this as the mean. So, in Cascais, really, the mean sea level is above the sea level they uh, designed for 1938. That was the basis for the nivelation, the leveling of all Portugal. So all our maps have a, a mean sea level, zero uh, altitude, that is connected not with this, and now sea level is really a, a bit uh, above that, okay? Sometimes this, is, this can be important. So uh, uh, a person who I respect because of the does a very good job and publish all the data in the internet and I can use this for my students to build uh, the tidal <coughs> curves, Carlos Antunes, from the science faculty of Lisbon University <coughs> and he did with the Cascais data, the recent Cascais data because the Cascais data of P Permanent service for mean sea level, they are outdated. With this data, it built this thing. And here, and he arrives to the conclusion that we can have 4,1 millimeters per year. How did he get this? Okay. He did something. He removed the seasonal 
file the side lines. It means it, it removed the differences between summer, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, between summer and winter. It made an inverse barometric correction. And most important of all, the relative vertical velocity of the site was corrected. So this is very nice. I am going to dip a little more this way. So the correction was an uplift, invented, really invented, an uplift of half a millimeter for the sky for every year. Uh, so this was the corrective mean sea level and so and sea level trend we arrived to was four millimeters per And so he made this curve. You see, the force data are from the P permanent surface for mean sea level, and he had several trends. As you see, uh, the, the, the trend from the beginning to the end of the data of permanent service for mean sea level is 1,3 millimeters. And then it makes different kinds of, of trends and you write to this one, the stupid one, of 4 millimeters per year, which is a nonsense really. Yeah. Using half a millimeter for correction, tectonic correction, because we thought that Cascais was uplifting. We are going to see that it's not uplifting at all. Because we have GPS all over the peninsula, and also at Cascais, of course, and at the Lagos. At Porto is not near the coastline, so it doesn't interest us. And at Cascais, the vertical solution for the GPS from before 2000 till 2014, and you can see that there is a slight trend for subsidence at the Cascais coastline. So not an uplift, a subsidence. And at Lagos, even a more clear uh, uh, subsidence, about half a millimeter each year. So, so you have come to see the consequences of all this. Uh, of course, you know, everyone knows here that you have a police in Scandinavia and you have uh, okay, subsiding so, so here in the four volts. With the data of the GPS all over Europe, I made this graph, which is the most important graph I made. Unfortunately, it can't be read very well, but I can send you, as I, I sent you, the, the data uh, more readable. So you will see Scandinavia, the four volts, and the Iberian Peninsula. And in, in the Iberian Peninsula, you have places we, where the land is subsiding, <coughs> most of them are subsiding areas. The blue are all subsiding, and you have some places where the land is uplifting. The positive, the orange marks are uplifting. <coughs> so they, they give us the result. The result only for five places. The absolute sea level, discounting on the tectonic trends. So we have uh, a stable sea level. You see, half a millimeter upper or down at Corunha, a uh, rising sea level of less than one millimeter, less than half than one millimeter, I think. And the, the biggest trend is here at Cabbage. Were to about two millimeters, okay, of absolute sea level rise. It's the only data they consider, okay. So, conclusions. <coughs> I talked a lot already. Uh, um, most of them are very short. And the causes of the erosion, what are they? The, the place, the restaurant, was called the Titanic. Oh dear. <laughs> Here. So it was the cause of 
the erosion. Uh, okay. yes. In Portugal, the causes of erosion are not related to the sea level. They are related with man-made constructions. And here you see the, the trends, as everyone had problems, but the trends uh, advancing, uh, cost, retreating cost. And they are all of them connected with man-made man -made constructions. Like in Avey, you see this? It's a big lagoon, they opened it, they made this, this, uh, uh, this, okay, this thing to protect the entrance of the sand. And so the literal drift stops here, and you have erosion down drift as inevitable. The, the, the main reason is the rivers. The rivers are, are damned. And so it was the natural situation for the rivers and the actual situation. The main river is the Dome, of course, but we should be swimming. 85% of the sediments don't never arrive to the coastline. So, you see, I, I told more or less the conclusion. You can read them, I'm not going to read them. But I would like to emphasize that sea level rise as a primary factor for coastal erosion is simply false. Thank and thanks for your attention. You're right back. And he has spent his entire life looking at the actualities in the field. There's scarcely a coastline he hasn't visited, and he has based his work on solid geological and geomorphological actualities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this is the title. Uh, some of the sea level papers in recent times. Uh, yes, glacial isostasy. This one you could remember because that is when they uh, discuss what is going on uh, with the loading idea of uh, Peltier and uh, uh, Lambert. Okay. So, of course. Give me a stable point, I uh, lift the earth, as I was supposed to say. <laughs> In, uh, we don't have a stable point, but we have time and space. And with this, uh, <clears throat> we can do something, we can really start to lift something and understand the amplitude and rates of different processes. The problem is that true science of sea level change is based on observation and fact long-term knowledge and physical laws has become gravely vulgarized by modeling in recent days. It's, this is how it is. Okay, and the main three factors controlling sea level for uh, the future sea level, okay, there are many controlling on the long term. Changing in the ocean water volume, that is glacial use as the ultimate frame, if you know what we're talking about, is 10 millimeter per year because that was the maximum rate you at the most rapid melting of ice. So, for example, in Stockholm area, ice margin withdraw 300 meters per year, but at the same time it flow forward 500 meters. So the real melting was about seven to eight hundred meters per year. It's an enormous melt. We had ice, we had enormous uh, climate forcing, we had, don't have the anything like that now. It's the largest forcing that we had at the end of the Young and Dryers into the Holocene. And still sea level, global sea level didn't rise more than 10 millimeters per year. What does it tell you? What does it tell you? That no one can come and say that it will be more than one meter in the center. If they do that, there's something wrong with it. Okay, the other is the thermal expansion, the steric effect. The ultimate frame is about one, uh, five millimeter per year. Um, and uh, your short term, and then it goes up 
and down. It's not unidirectional. It's going up and down. <coughs> and at shore, of course, it is always zero because there's no water to expand that. And I will go back to it. And then the redistribution of the water, which is very, very important. It is going from one place to another. And I will try to show. These are the three variables. And we can handle them uh, with rates and amplitude. This is the glacier you stand. It can never, ever be more than um, in amplitude meters in rate 10 million per year. We have to be inside there. In the last 300 years, we have been in this uh, green box. <coughs> One millimeter per year or uh, um, what, 10 centimeters per, per 100 years. That is nothing. And these are the observed field observed here somewhere. But those who are talking about things here, one meter, two meter geo, they are just wrong. It's against physics. It's against physics. It's against observational fact. You have to. Um, the satellite altimetry is here somewhere. And we go back to it later. Next one. In this steric heating, you have the water expansion and the water column. The, many, the longer the column is, the more it will change. And this is the, this is the temperature change. Two uh, centigrade is very, very much on the uh, ocean surface. Of course it is. But look at <coughs> more than we, we, we earlier thought it was up at 300 meters. This is really up down to 700 meters you heat it from above. And we are talking here about <coughs> 10, 10 centimeters. If you go further, it doesn't matter because it's only the upper part of the So about 10 centimeters at the most uh, uh, in 100 years time it will be. But that goes up and down, so it's, it's not unidirectional. If you go to an area where the water depth is only 100 meters, 3.5 centimeters. 10 meters if it's only 3.5 millimeters. That's just nothing. And if you are at the coast, it is Nothing. Yeah. Zero. <laughs> Zero. And then some people say, but it's all going to flush into the coast. No, 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 no. Look at what, what has happened with the ocean surface. It's a dynamic surface. It's compensated. It's sitting there. That's why we have all this irregularity in the Earth. Both the geoidal one and the other is the dynamic one. This is the dynamic thing. It has been immediately compensated, so it's <laughs> controlled by, by gravity. So, yeah, uh, but here it's zero. Uh, next one. So, out here we have the basin volume changes, the water mass changes, the glacier use, the, the thermal expansion. Here it's of course much less. The thermal expansion is fine. Here it is very, it, it, there is no. And a thermal expansion. This is, of course, glacier used as it. Read the dynamic effects. Those are the largest ones. The, the all kind of dynamic effects changes the coastline. Maria just talked about erosion and what they are doing with the coast, playing with the coast. Mass water movement, compaction, and tectonics. And tectonics here, and then they go to work. So these are the facts at the coast. Then we come to sea level rose during the last up to the, about 6,040 years ago. You can see all curves, wherever you are and how different they are, they are all rising up to that. After about this period, they start to, to redistribute, and then becomes a dominant factor of redistributing of water. And that's where it plays very hard with the changes in the rotation of the Earth. But that's how I began seeing this, and in 19, uh, 96 was for the first time able to see up the test of the problem with the um, uh, solar wind effects. Okay. So this is the system of surface tides. I mean, the only easy one to, to change is, of course, the surface. Uh, the most important one, of course, the yellow, the Kurosha and the Gulf Stream, because it takes hot water at the equator and brings it to, to the north. That's the change in the angular momentum 
directly. So any change in this way, it has to be compensated. <laughs> so it is a compensation like that, constantly. Okay, then we have the other one, east-west, and the, the other consequences. Uh, changes in the Earth's rotation generate the redistribution of water masses. Okay, here is this is thousands uh, uh, thousand years ago, uh, 980, no, thousand AD, 911, 1200 AD. In the Tanzania, uh, Tanzania coast, it's there, and up here you have the Peruvian. It's but when it was a high here, water massive pushed on here, it was a low in the Peruvian. 100 years or 60 years or whatever, we had a high here and a low here. It meant water masses were swashing back and forth in this direction. Okay. Then we come to something which is really nice and interesting. Redistribution of water mass during solar maxima and solar minima. Uh, during the solar maxima, the, uh, the Gulf Stream was directed all the way up here. We have higher sea level here. We have higher temperature because of the heat stored in, in, in the ocean water. In Indian Ocean, we had a low. We had a high there, we had a low. Then in uh, the solar minima, uh, the Gulf Stream turned this way, and Arctic water penetrated all the way down to Coimbra in Portugal, and it was a very cold period here, known as Little Ice Ages, and we had a lower sea level for sure. In the Indian Ocean, at exactly the same time, we had high sea level. Isn't that nice and interesting? So, it is this very books which are out there, I think it was the first time I really pinpointed those changes. So now I will take you on an excursion over the globe. I think we begin here in the Indian Ocean. Seven sides and everything is open. There's no rice there in sea, in sea level. It's a stable, plus and minus one. You have this Pacific sides, also zero. We go to uh, here in uh, Suriname, it's also Syria. We go up to the North Sea area and Kattegat area, and then, there you have those values. It's a little rise. And we go to Venice, which is another wonderful test area. It's zero. And if you go to American coast, we have to discuss that because uh, they are messing up things like the acceleration. So, this is the Indian Ocean. Uh, it, the, the Maldives, the Bangladesh, and the Goa. <coughs> First of all, you can see it's a remarkable coincidence, coincidence with these two curves. And high here during uh, the cold period in the uh, low sea level here, with peat formation, and here are salt kilns, kilns found below sea level, a submerged harbor, and here we have a painting by the um, uh, Portuguese which were living in Goa, of the high abundant um, um, harbor and the uh, new harbor with ships in, to, in it. And then comes the high level and then uh, late, um, about um, 1960, fall in sea level, fall in sea level again, fall in sea level again. Here we got in 1970, here we see but it's, we will go through a couple of those things. But it's a very interesting way. So if you go to the, to the Maldives, this is what we will see. Look here for it. It's erosion going on. And some people say, erosion? Oh, it means sea level rise. No, sea level rise. Erosion doesn't mean sea level rise. It means something has changed. Even more if it's lowering because the equilibrium line is, has been coming into to the dynamics so you say. Here, <coughs> and look at the coast to this side. The, 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 the sand taken here, it's been displaced this way and down. The old shore 
It's there, it's a fossil shore, it is starting to be overgrown, it's abandoned. That was the old one, and now we are here. We have another place, we have high uh, rock cat platform, and we have a, a map from 1922 showing sea, uh, sea level in here. Now sea level is here, and it, this is the fall at about 1970. And then you, you can see this one is, is this operating. It is fresh, the other is weather. And here we can say the high one, this one, uh, that one is this one, and the pr present. And we have the famous tree, which was staying there for 50 years. They said, God, if sea level would have run, recent, it would be gone. And when I came there to shoot the movie, it was lying down, and I said, oh, I was wrong, because the scientists don't those things there. Somebody said, change their mind. I was immediately open to change my mind. But then the people had a little, uh, oh, uh, little uh, cafeteria there. They said, no, oh, no, I asked them, when was it taken? No, it was not taken. It was a group of Australian scientists which uh, pulled it down. <laughs> That's a good sign.
one, which is just nothing. And after 1970, you can see it has even turned the other way around. Uh, in uh, uh, Suriname, we have a very nice Here is, of course, zero. The satellite altimetry gives 3.8. There is a message in this mess. Uh, this is a long story about um, the American uh, East Coast. But what is shown, this is a fantastic um, reading of the static curve. And here you can see what the other do. If the hockey stick is there, it doesn't fit the continuation of this. This one is what they claim it is. But you have to put that back here. And then it doesn't give you. It's a false. So all the time, all the station goes that there. But you have the satellite activity and IPCC is here. But all the other are here. But, and yes, and when we just summarize it, everything is between uh, uh, 0, 0.0 and 1. There is the regional variability over the globe. You have to change the satellite activity because they were fiddling with it. Here. The first original data was here. Three years later, they pushed it up. And if you ask me, I can tell you why they did The grace analysis of, uh, of um, gravity showed a trend here. So we can know that it's going back. If we, if we tilt it back, it gets a factor of 0.45 millimeters per year. And that is the NOAA data. If you have uh, um, University of Colorado, uh, it gets 0.65. So the satellite activity is about 0.5 plus or minus uh, 0.5. <coughs> Six inches. <laughs> no. You can cope with that. Kill a slide that time was the one that limited the increase in sea level, that little box. I thought that was the killer slide. Because obviously in the AGW, uh, rising, rising sea levels are. I was saying that in rising sea levels, yes. in the AGW thing, that is one of the things that I'm really concerned about, so trying to worry people about. I think your killer slide was the one which limited the amount yep. of Thank rise you. to that little box. Yep. I think that's the killer one. Thank you. And then this comment. Yeah. In a key role to review paper. Hans Jelvin. <laughs> uh, Niklas, is there an explanation why uh, the satellite ultimately give such high value. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yes, yes, it is. Do so actually. I have to such a little bit stronger. Uh, yes, it is. And now we go to this. Where are you? This. This. With him. Jim. Jim. Next question. Jim is that. Uh, in Hong Kong, they have six high gauges. And Kelsey made the models of this recovery after the ice age, the global isostasy. I'm talking about the regional isostasy. Okay? So when it's Sweden is going up, 
Holland is going down. And when Sweden is, um, this ice, when ice is there, this is going down. And when it melts, Holland is going up. And the opposite, okay? But Peltier and the others say that this effect is all over the globe. Gravitational, yes, that's for sure. But for long term, slow accommodation, like an amoeba. This is not no longer a solid earth, it's an amoeba. But it, it means that you have no low viscosity asthenosphere channel, but you have a, a linear profile down the That is not the observation, that is not theology. But if his model would be right, and one of his zero passed through uh, um, and then he saw the title, and look at page 80 in your, in your book, because there you see the terrible uh, Taipei station where it has, something has happened. But that was used to level the zero into a rise of 2.3. Okay? And all the thing was published up to <coughs> 2000, um, 2000. And then 2003 it was lifted. The whole spectrum had been lifted up by, uh, to 2.3 uplift. And then they had another one, so they came up to, to uh, 3.1. It was also uh, uh, Enzo Evans, um, Enzo Evans, which interfered there. So they, they thought that it was a rising sea level by the 1998 uh, uh, end. But it was Just a comment uh, on the altimetry data. Um, I'm in the oil exploration business and we use altimetry data to uh, identify the presence of sedimentary basins on the shelf, where the lower density means that the, the, uh, the sea level is lower. And conversely, um, in the abyssal plain, for example, where the rocks are are a denser and you're near a bigger sphere, the density is different and therefore the, the, um, the, the sea is, 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 uh, is lower there. So that's also an effect that you have to build into your models, but I'm sure you do that already. Yeah, I was the one, I was the one who started the business of UE changes in 1971 and the big paper in 1976. It's the gravitational potential and in the New Guinea, it's a trough of, of, of uh, 104 meters low. And then I went to London to investigate that. So during the ice age, <coughs> instead of being a lower of 120, it's a lower of 160. Okay? And that means that the, uh, it was a higher relief. But that's a completely different story. Yeah, let me, let me add to that a little bit. The satellites don't have the resolution needed to resolve to the millimeter level. Yeah. No. The radars, mm -hmm. yeah. the best radar on the satellites do 23 millimeters uh, or 56 millimeters yeah. if you use the G radars. Uh, the other thing is they don't do a transition near the shore very well. They don't do well in storms because when wave action happens and a satellite radar comes on a wave that is has a sideways thing, the, it, the signal doesn't bounce back to the satellite, so they have to use a wider footprint. Uh, high pressure over an ocean depresses the ocean. A low air pressure like a storm or a hurricane rises the ocean. The sea level isn't able to be measured at the resolution needed to come up with a three millimeters a year. So what they do is they do the estimates. They build in factors, adjustments. There is no reality to that 3.3 millimeter sea level rise. It just isn't there. So sorry, the satellites just don't work too well. Uh, again, go to my website, there's a presentation about two years ago I did on the satellites using the NASA data that was available to me. They just don't work as advertised in sea level. They were great on measuring temperature in the air. Why? Because they're measuring within a region of the atmosphere that they can resolve. They cannot resolve to the millimeter level. Okay, thank you very much for that comment. But of course, this is another problem, how you interpret it. But people had interpreted it. It's out there in the literature. 3.3 plus and minus something. And that's the thing which is over and over being, being cited. And 
I, I, that's why it's important for me. I have to show that that figure is wrong. They have made adjustment to it, which is not physical. It is personal adjustment. When I presented this for the first time in uh, 2005 at, in, in Moscow at the Academy of Science, uh, I made it a little fast. So the little man from, uh, from uh, IPCC, uh, England's delegation, I said this. Said, then he rose and said, yeah, as an explanation. We had to make a tilt, otherwise, we had to do this correction, otherwise it wouldn't have been a tilt. And I said, did you hear what you were saying yourself? <laughs> this is exactly what I am accusing you of. It's a uh, correction. <coughs> We should have mesh. Everything should be mesh. That's why 0.65 or 0.45 is tilting back to what they started reading. Two more questions, I think, sir. Um, I've been here for a few guys for two days, and I've been in university for two years, and I've learned more in two days than having two years of university. <laughs> I'm 27 years old, and something is glaringly obvious to me. We've got standard form for science, but we don't have a global observation platform that we can all work for. We're working with satellites, we're working with sea data, we've got all this stuff going on, but it's not uniform between all of us. We've got billions going into climate change, but why isn't that billions creating a way of actually knowing how our planet works with a uniform system around the world. We've got it with communications, it's time to do it with an observation platform so we know what's really going on. At least we get some standards. Yes, yeah, exactly. quite right. <laughs> Catastrophic anthropogenic global warming hypothesis. And the first talker is uh, Madhav Kamleka, and he's going to talk about climate change and extreme weather, project uh, weather projection, perception, and reality. Thank you. Can you hear this? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. It's a pleasure to talk to you on this subject. Lots and lots of media attention is on this. So, what is... Okay, let me see how it works. Yeah, all extreme weather went under us. Short answer, no. The long answer, no. <laughs> yeah. There are extreme weather always in the sky. Go back to 200, 500 years of good data, there were extreme weather all. So what is this present concern? It is because of media hype. I'll give you an example. Just two months ago, there were New Orleans flood, before that there were Texas flood, and around uh, in the uh, US, French Open tennis tournament, there were floods in northern Germany and France. So all our Canadian media kind of go, oh, she has to do something in the plural. There are two groups of scientists who have proposed different mechanics. IPCC started in 1988. They have provided five-year report, now about four or five. Mm -hmm. In IPCC, not governmental, international planet on climate change, several hundred scientists now, Nicholas Murner, myself, <coughs> first comprehensive report in 2009. So what did these <laughs> okay, what is the mechanism? IPCC said the warm weather, the warm climate with more moisture, so because of more moisture, you have lots of rain in one area, no rain in another droughts. So we have rain floods, droughts along with the heat waves and so on. Then IPCC is a more intense tropical cycle, increases the extreme rainfall, decreases in cool days. This is the 
And yes, one month, July 861, 930 centimeters. Whereas, with the wet spot, Chera Pundi in Kassa. And yes, one year, 1867, 2647 centimeters range oh, one year. <laughs> so, recent study on human weight in the data to extreme record are without any merit. Most of these studies, the point uh, rainfall 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter, there's nothing in terms of tropical cyclones or monsoonal waves. Any given day, sometimes a torrential day in monsoonal climate, monsoon season, can produce 150 to 200 millimeters of day rain in a day. Drought spreads and in so, in so well, I said earlier, in so events in the Equatorial Pacific Green summer rain store, US Canadian prairies, cold events on the other hand are being retrieved. And El Nino and La Nina link to droughts and floods. In the Indian summer monsoons, in so and TDO, the city decayed across the children, with dry wet conditions over eastern Australia, Indonesia, Southeast China, and East Africa. In so is the single most largest cause of global expectation. Now, this is the early of September 97. Look at the amount of warm water around. West coast of South America. The area of warm water, plus two degrees or above, is almost three quarters as large as the size of Canada. This was the strongest El Nino in 50 years. And this strong El Nino produced 1998 as the warmest year according to IPCC. Now they are declaring 2016, which is again linked to 2015. Summer monsoon, India and South Asia. India, South Asian monsoon impacts 2 billion people every year. Major droughts occur, occur regularly, droughts are the spread in a 200 year excellent data set. And so is the major driver of South Asian monsoon. Besides and so, there are other factors, Indian Ocean dipole, Passivarian oscillation to which you have know, mentioned, and my own favorite thing, heavy snow accumulation during previous winter can produce a drier monster. Lots of studies have been done. Next, droughts and floods, they often come in back to back. Example, 18 flood, 17 drought. 19 for given extreme drought, 42 flood. <coughs> 87 extreme drought, 88 flat. 87 was an El Nino year, 88 was a La Nina year. 2009, recent one, 2008. I'll give you two examples here of oh, major drought temperature. As you can see, very irregular space. 200 years of very good data. Most drought years are linked with El Nino. Most Flood years are good monsoon year, as I call it, are linked with planning and plus other factors. The worst drought, 1877. I think less than 50% of the rain fell over the whole of the year. Several million cattle died, possibly several thousands of people died, but no good record was available. This happened more than 130 years ago. Two example, 2009 drought monsoon. Next year, 2010, a relatively good monsoon. Pakistan flood in yeah. late August, early September. And once again, there was media news. Oh, this flood is in Pakistan with 20% of the area and the water is certainly due to global warming. What else? Okay. Now, our winter weather extremes on the rise. Let's look at it. Winter 2012, extreme cold in Czech Republic. Minus 40 degrees locally for almost a week. Several people died of cold, extreme cold, lack of heating or poor housing, etc. 
Winter 2003, heavy snows in Central Europe. March 2003, coldest month in Berlin, according to the report. 2013, 14, winter, longest, coldest, and slowest over North America. With several blizzards and heavy snow. February of 2014, saw heavy snow in Japan, also parts of China. Winter 2015, Boston broke all time record. Boston <coughs> 300 centimeters of snow. Elsewhere, Eastern Canada hit up by several <laughs> snowstorms with 50 centimeters minimum, especially in Eastern Canada. Also, you might remember in Pandishi Valley in Afghanistan, heavy snow avalanches killed over 250 people in early. February of 2003. So what is happening to the Earth's planet? As we observe it, I am an observational guy. So let's look at it. This is the recent, 23rd January 2016 in Washington area. A monster, two feet of snow, about one billion dollars in damage. Schools and Offices were closed for a few days to a week. Lots of work had to be done to remove the snow. Sometimes <coughs> Washington doesn't have enough snow plow, especially if you go down into North Carolina. I remember my wife was there two years ago. And there is snow, everything looks stopped because there are no snow removal equipment. Anyway, this is in Washington about a week later. Unusual cold wave sweeps across East Asia. 65 feet. This is Taiwan. Just a week later. Why? Let's go a couple more. In Alaska, 2012 January, it is too much snow even for Alaska. <laughs> 387 centimeters of snow fell in early January of 2012. Some more snowfall record, yes, 2012, Sunshine the Ski Resort in Western Canadian Rockies, 910 centimeters. Okay, now global weather related disaster losses as a proportion of global weather. This is the latest <coughs> new rain graph. What it shows is a steady decline in the Percentage impact of GDP on global weather disaster. The two spikes, peak, peaks, sorry, spikes, Hurricane Katrina, one single Hurricane Katrina caused economic damage of over 150 billion dollars. 2011, severe tornadoes in the United States, <coughs> another spike in global weather disaster. Elsewhere, there are, of course, floods are there, I don't deny that. But as you can see, the amount of damage as uh, as relating to the G is declining. Okay. So what is the summary? The link between global warming and extreme weather is more perception than reality. The perception because everybody talks about it. Especially yeah. in the media. There is no increase in extreme weather when it is Global weather related disaster losses have actually declined in recent years. Finally, a lighter side of the global warming side. <laughs> warming forecast grows weak, weaker. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.
There's not going to be much uh, on the screen at all you're going to get. So you can go quietly to sleep, and it's good because um, I am quoting uh, because I'm going to be thinking about the issue of ethics and the basis of science. I'm going to embarrass everyone because I'm going to talk bits and pieces from the Bible. Now, don't panic. I don't think no, I I don't think the Earth was created six thousand years ago. Anything like that. I don't, in fact, think that the Bible is a scientific textbook and never was intended to. Uh, but I am not just going to quote a few scriptures from there. But also, I'd like to quote uh, our, our speaker on um, CO2 and sea level, which I love the one about, um, in God we trust, but all others bring data. And I think that's an admirable and excellent start to uh, a discussion of the ethics in science. We had an Archbishop of Canterbury a thousand years ago here in Britain, whose name was Ansel. And I quote him in English, you'll be happy to hear. He was Ansel of Aosta, in fact. I suspect he was an Italian. Uh, and he said this, For I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. I want you to keep that in mind. Because scientific inquiry, all that we've been talking about in these last two days, is by default and by definition a sceptical pursuit. That is what we are about. If you are a scientist, you are by, def by default, rightly, a sceptic. Which is why I think it's so absurd that we're called sceptics, as if it's some kind of insult. Because it is that method that has proved in the past so remarkably fruitful from research into medicine, to computers, to astrophysics, to quantum theory, and indeed even in issues of meteorology and climate, as well as geology, in so many areas. To be skeptical about your investigations and to test them is the essence of good science. But, um, Niels had this uh, picture of Atlas carrying the world, and in fact I think it was Archimedes who said, give me a fulcrum and I can move the world. Actually, science as a lever, which it is, needs a fulcrum. It needs an anchor, a baseline from which to act. Because all of us who are scientific or have a scientific background, as <coughs> to some degree I do, we all instinctively rely on what that base is without sometimes articulating it. It is that the universe we are looking into is reasonable. It operates, of course, to reasonable laws that are in principle discoverable, that these laws are consistent when we discover them correctly, and as I said, are by default, therefore, discoverable and researchable. <laughs> now, I don't expect every scientist to sit down every morning and scratch their head and think, why do I believe that? Because I think actually that way madness lies, uh, because it would drive you mad. But the question remains, why is the universe comprehensible? And why can human beings make headway in this comprehension? It's part there, I think, we can ask the question because we are more than just scientists. The question stands whether you ask it to yourself every day. But in a sense, the reasonableness of the cosmos has to be treated, in effect, as an axiom of research. Because if we did an experiment today, which was not repeated tomorrow when we tried it and did something completely different, we would be out at sea. And I suppose it's fair to say, and I say it cautiously, that ancient cultures, which had not got specific ideas about this, these questions, tended to be polytheistic and often did not progress in any meaningful way in the sciences, because from their perspective, their uh, gods could do anything, and therefore there was no point in trying to work out what they were up to. So, science needs a platform. And my contention would be that among all religions, Judaism and Christianity, with its stress on a deity, or in what you will, who created all things, is a good platform to begin. Quoting the old Torah, that is the old Jewish Testament, and the Gospel of John, one of Jesus' followers, they both begin their writings in the beginning and in Genesis, it's God created the heavens and the earth. And in John's Gospel, we read these words in Greek. En arche 
of Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the logic, the Logos, the reason, which is the foundation of everything. Now some might argue, well, John was just quoting from the Greek Stoics, but actually he was not. He was quoting, in effect, from the Old Testament. I have time to read it. Uh, I don't want to keep you long, as Henry VIII would say to a new wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a wonderful passage in uh, the Hebrew book of Proverbs about wisdom, Sophia, uh, and about how wisdom was the very skilled craftsman who brought about the world and indeed was God's agent. So before modern science really got going at all, here I contend in the Logos is an undermining, an underpinning requirement. The Bible is not a book of science. It doesn't purport to be so. And I must say, I see the wars of science and religion, and there have been some pretty disgraceful moments on both sides, uh, and as our uh, a recent speaker, uh, Pamela, said, I think at the moment the Christians are in the doghouse there at the moment, in certain quarters anyway. But modern science, as I said, requires the Judeo Christian base from which to begin. A reasonable universe that has a logos behind it and a logos that we can pursue <coughs> as rational and reasonable human beings. However, of course, it could be suggested that this basis is merely a chrysalis out of which modern science could emerge, fully fledged, and able then to fly on its own without the need for a base. But I would flag up, have a care. This can lead to the thought that undoes all thought. If all events are simply consequences of earlier events in an unseeing and purposeless cosmos, it follows that all thoughts are similarly leading merely the byproducts of a chemical process in our brains. At this point, all reason plunges irrecoverably into a metaphorical black hole. My reasoning to deal with your reasoning is neither true nor false, but merely an epiphenomenon of neural activity in my brain. As I said, the great civilizations way, way back in the past, Egypt, Greece, China, India, even Rome, all actually failed to progress very far in the sciences as we would now describe them, partly because of their background lack of a solid base. Now we often think the Greeks gave us modern science. They did only in a sense. The reintroduction of Greek philosophies of Aristotle and Plato into the West uh, in the, uh, just the post-medieval period, in a sense held back science. <coughs> It broke through, but it did, in a sense, hold it back. The tendency for the church, and here was one of its many mistakes, to grasp the uh, astronomy, and as the one while would remind us, the astrology of Ptolemy, uh, tended to prevent discussion. Problem? Nothing new there. <laughs> we seem to be there again. Often, too, because much of it was bound up, if it not, not with the, that kind of thing, with philosophy, they were often asking the wrong kinds of questions. The question why, rather than the question how, which is far more the domain of science, not the only question you can ask. I want to read a, a quote from a book by Rodney Stark called The Victory of Reason. And although this is not primarily about science, it's about the development of the West that follows to a considerable degree with the, uh, hand in hand with the development of science and also of the material well-being of the West. And he concludes his book by quoting one of China's leading scholars, modern China's leading scholars, quote, One of the things we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success in fact, the preeminence of the West over all the world. We studied everything we could from a historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next we focused on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West is so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism, 
and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. That's Chinese, modern Chinese scholars. Interesting statement. So, if there is a base, and if it is the Logos, and I would say God, what about the scientists who, as it were, laid our foundations in terms of Western development, people like Newton and Kepler? Well, interestingly, I have a quote from Kepler, which was a prayer. O oh God, I am thinking thy thoughts after thee. That was Kepler. Newton said it somewhat similarly, but perhaps with less reverence. He said, I'm really thinking God's thoughts after him. So, I would hold that this gives us the principles as not only of research and logic and reason and experiment, and it's important that we get it right. And then if we don't, of course, we get ourselves into trouble. But in the Old Testament, or the Torah, we have all sorts of useful pragmatic rules as well. The first one, I would quote familiar for most of us, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Lying in scientific papers is giving false testimony to your neighbor. Here's another one. It seems practically practical and domestic. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. <laughs> Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest ifa and an honest hin. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Similarly in the Torah, a repeat of the same thing. Do not have two differing weights in your bag. <laughs> one heavy, one light. Do not have two differing measures in your house. One large, one small. You must have accurate and honest weights and measures, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And here from Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, another one, test everything, hold on to the good. Now all these form an obvious foundation that I know all of us here as scientists or interested in science would hold to. Honest weights, honest measures, not telling lies, being honest about doubt, saying that you don't know and if you don't know, uh, making it clear. As Bertram Russell put it, ascertainable truth is piecemeal, partial, uncertain and difficult. Just because you do these things honestly doesn't mean to say it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean to say that the research was going to drop out of the sky, I wish it would, but it doesn't. Things don't always work out. It's a hard slog, but it's worth it. The Lord God used the old-fashioned word to get a blessing. A blessing of discovering God's thoughts after him. But if you break these principles, there will be what, again, the Bible will call judgments that will follow. At the very least, with confusion of thought and action, but more likely with serious dangers for human life. Ignore the findings from proper reason and proper data to suit your own ideas, and bridges will collapse, ships sink, Planes fall from the sky, and uh, space probes go awry. Twist the data about climate and the atmosphere and predictions. You will cause agricultural disasters, waste vast sums of money, and as I'm sure Christopher is going to be sharing with us, it is the poor who suffer the worst because of this. And God doesn't view that with any kindness. In the public forum, which should be the domain of science, I think there's a lot of confusion anyway about the scientific process. <coughs> As we've had from the media, the journalists and the media broadcasters will say, scientists tell us. And the public, therefore, must be under the impression that an oracle has spoken the truth and must therefore be accepted. Again, the Torah comes to our aid. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? Somebody gets up and says something. If a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord, what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is the message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Now there's a message to take home as well when we're dealing with these people. Now, how am I doing? Five minutes, okay? We'll spin on a bit. I think most of us fully understand the nature of um, hypothesis, theory, and law. 
Um, how they work in science, how hypothesis is a bright idea that some guys have, and scientists have bright ideas every morning, and by the evening most of them are dead. Um, but every occasionally one survives of it, and you start testing it, and if the experiments support it, and indeed experiments you should be conducting against your hypothesis also still show that your hypothesis is correct, then it can move towards becoming a theory. And of course a theory, well, uh, it remains a theory. Uh, it may be adapted, it may eventually fall, uh, it is never true, except in the sense that it is provisionally true, and that's an important thing to remember. Way back again in the time of Newton, there was it were, a parting of the ways and the way science worked between Newton and Descartes. Now Descartes was actually a philosopher in the Greek tradition. And he believed in the power of mathematics, as did Newton, in understanding the world we live in. But he worked far more on the principle that if I imagine how something works, and I can make my maths make it look good, then that's what happens. Newton, for all his many faults, would go the other route. I will see what happens when I do experiments, and then I will apply my mathematics to pull it together. That's how Newton worked. And of the two, Primarily, and I don't, want, I don't want to cast total aspersions on, uh, on Descartes in this regard. But nonetheless, Newton was right, and Descartes essentially was taking a dangerous route. The trouble is, Descartes is with us again today mm -hmm. in all the computer models that we see being manufactured in so called climate science. That is Cartesian science. It is saying this is what I imagine happens, and I will twiddle my machines until it seems to fit the data. Which is why, as an earlier speaker rightly said, how few of these people are out in the field doing what Newton did, which was to find out what was happening before deciding how to put it together and begin to make some understanding of it. So, Newton was on the right lines, but sadly today, it seems to me as if Descartes is back in fashion. The imaginary world of computer models rules over the real world of facts and observations. Let me again quote those Chinese professors, and with this I'm going to end. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West is so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. Is it then? Perhaps no coincidence, but as the West abandons, its baseline for science by abandoning the Judeo-Christian perspective that we are seeing the rise of ideological pseudoscience based not on reason but on ideologies which stem just from the human imagination. Thank you, gentlemen. Certainly was. Unfortunately, London University is no longer a home for professors, doctors, and learned fathers of science. Shame on the lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Now, at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for which I, for my sins, was an expert reviewer for that last report, they do not call a spade a spade. <laughs> that would be too simple. <laughs> no, they call it 
A one-person operated, manually controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust, yet adequately efficacious lignin metallic composition. <laughs> this is then primarily, though by no means exclusively, for utilization on the part of allied grade operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural, or constructional trades or industries, as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavation or tasks or duties as may from time to time be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, desirable, expedient, apposite, or germane. With regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task, or objective in hand, or on the other hand, underfoot, Secretary General. <laughs> <laughs> God isn't speaking Latin, he speaks mathematics, and so what I'm going to do is to give you a rather heavily mathematical presentation. And first of all, I want to have the next slide to show you there has been global warming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful to uh, Professor M.I. Black of the Indian Geological Survey for kindly communicating to me this important result in climate geological survey dynamics. <laughs> next slide, please. And as you can see, deforestation is. <laughs> so, how are we going to resolve these difficult problems? Let's have the next slide, please. We're going to look, first of all, to see whether or not all the talking about global warming and the need to contain CO2 emissions has made any difference. Next slide, please. And there you can see this is the official annual audit of how much CO2 has been emitted worldwide. And as you will see, it is running at above, quite considerably above, the high end or business as usual case first predicted by the IPCC in 1990. All these conferences, all this talking has made absolutely no difference to the amount of CO2. So if anyone tells you, Good. well, the reason why it isn't warming up very fast is that the CO2 is now in the under control, just show them this graph. Next slide, please. And this is why, because China, <coughs> Mr. Obama exempted from the Paris climate process for the sake of getting their agreement to allow it in the way that they stopped the Copenhagen one, is, is increasing its emissions and is not under any obligation, legal, moral, or other, under the Paris Climate Treaty to, treaty to make any controls whatsoever, either before or after 2030. It was on that basis, on that basis alone, that they agreed that they would sign up to the treaty, and then <laughs> the CO2 will continue to rise, regardless of anything we in the West. Oh, good news. Yet global warming, despite the fact that the CO2 is rising above prediction, is below prediction. Next slide. And this is the global warming speedometer. And you'll see there the two satellite records of temperature in green and the various predictions made by the IPCC in its first three assessment reports in pink and red. And as you'll see, there is no correspondence whatsoever between the prediction and the reality. Next slide. And there is an early prediction by Hansen. And as you'll see, the observed data in green there is 20 directions <coughs> below the very lowest case that he then predicted. Next slide, please. In 1988, he made another prediction, a famous one of the <coughs> Congress. And there, the black line is observation. And as you'll see, his main prediction on the red line. Again, no correspondence between the two. Next slide. And here are the IPCC predictions in 1990, set against the observed outturn on all five of the major uh, data, <coughs> three terrestrial and two uh, the green ones there which are satellite. Once again you can see the trend is entirely on all data sets well below the least prediction of the IPCC. Next slide. And you'll see there a comparison done by the RSS uh, controller, uh, uh, Dr. Carl Mears, and he shows the 33 IPCC models in, in pale green there, and the black line is the global temperature change actually measured by RSS satellites. Once again, no correspondence between the two. Next slide. And the same in our very accident prone Met Office here. Mm -hmm. For years has been forecasting barbecue summers, and if anyone next sees a barbecue summer, can you wake me up? I'm not going to stay <laughs> Next slide. Uh, the CMIP 5, these are the latest models, once again against the RSS uh, temperature for the lower troposphere, TLT there. That also is an official slide from RSS. Next slide. And IPCC knows perfectly well that its models 
and its professors are getting this wrong. Next slide. As you will see, here is an enlargement of a postage stamp sized corner of one of the graphs in the fifth assessment report of 2013. You can see the two coloured lines there, the CMIT 3 and CMIT 5 uh, model predictions, and the observations are in black. Next slide. And here again, this is a very interesting one, because the RCP 4.5 is the scenario in the fifth assessment report that says there will be very, very little uh, influence from CO2 from now on, that we're going to get it under tight control. And yet look at the observed temperature change in relation even to that scenario, and once again it's trailing along at the bottom. That is an official IPCC graph. Next slide. And this is a comparison between the predictions made in the, by the IPCC in its 1990 first report, which you'll see in red, and the fifth report, which you'll see in green, which I got at because they were trying to make exaggerated predictions of medium term warming. I said, this will not do, you're going to get caught out if you stick with that, you've got to bring them down. So they did, and they barely overlap now with the previous <laughs> predictions, and as you can see, the actual trend in global temperature is well below the previous predictions. Next slide. Now, the question I'm addressing in this particular presentation is, Houston, they've got a problem. <laughs> Why did their predictions go wrong? Why, in particular, did the climate muddles, as I call them, predict more warming than has happened? Why did they get it wrong? Next slide. Now, this is the official climate sensitivity equation. And I show it to you in this form because this is derivable in this form from the documents of the IPCC. It is the official equation by which you determine how much warming you get per doubling of CO2 concentration at equilibrium. You'll see there the values for the radiative forcing from CO2, 3.708 watts per square meter per doubling of CO2. You will see the climate sensitivity parameter, lambda zero, which has a, a value of 3.2 to the minus 1, or about 0.313 a Kelvin per watt per square meter. And then you see the only other input <coughs> to this equation is the feedback sum C there in blue and right, which we're going to look at in the next slide, please. And there you'll see the values for the feedback sum, which are derived from various models in AR4, which is the previous assessment report of 2007, in grey at the bottom there, and AR5 in glorious technicolour at the top, and the values I've separated out so that you can see what we'll use those as inputs to that simple equation, which will allow us to treat the models as though they were a black box. And we have the equation that is our meter for measuring what they are, are saying officially is put into that box, and then we make sure that what we get out is what they say they get out. So we're going to calibrate that equation I've just shown you. Let's go to the next slide. Here again are the various values summarised, and I've added at the bottom the CDIP 3 models for the uh, 2007 assessment report. Uh, they were predicting 3.26 uh, Kelvin of global warming, with upper and lower bounds 2.2 and 4.4 Kelvin respectively. CDIP 5, 3.2, and 2.1 and 4.7. Next slide. And now we're going to calibrate that equation by using those inputs I've just shown you, the feedbacks along with the climate sensitivity parameter and the radiative forcing, to see whether we can get out those published sensitivities. And sure enough, we can, both the CMIT 3 at the top and the CMIT 5 at the bottom. The only real irregularity you'll see is that their central estimates seem a little bit on the high side, and that is the first indication that they're doing something wrong by their own lights. And I'm going to show you what that is. It's the first of a concatenated series of errors by which they have ended up, whether accidentally or deliberately, it's not for me to say, greatly mm -hmm. exaggerating climate sensitivity. Next slide. What we're going to do is look at these errors each in turn. The first one is the exaggeration of the central estimate. And here is just a bit of background. The variance of global mean surface temperature, either side of the 810,000 year period mean, derived from the ice cores in Antarctica by the official paper that integrates those results, which was Juzel et al. 2007, is just 3.3 Celsius, either side of that period mean. It's a very small movement. 
notwithstanding all the huge changes in forces and astronomical circumstances and meteorites and heaven knows what else that will have happened over that time. The temperature of the planet is near perfectly thermostatic. Yes, you can get ice ages at the bottom end of that range, you can get hot house earth at the top end. And we're somewhere in between, more towards the top end already as it happens. But you don't get much movement. In other words, the climate is essentially thermostatic. Now let's look at this next slide, and this is where we begin to see what's going on. Now this is very interesting. Because what you will see here is a non-linear response curve. Would anybody like to tell me what this curve actually is? What kind of a curve it is? Hyperbolic, thank you. Yeah, this, this man gets a prize. That's very good. It is, of course, oh, our first first class degree in astrophysics from <laughs> Piers Corbin. Of course, he would know this is a rectangular hyperbolic curve. And that is that curve of climate sensitivity against the feedback factors, F, the dimensionless feedback factors, <coughs> is hyperbolic because of the way the feedback factors are calculated. And it is therefore this very startling curve. And because of that, if you have a fairly wide range of feedback factors, you see here from 0.23 to 0.74, that translates to an enormously wide range of climate sensitivities, 1.5 to 4.5 Kelvin. And this range of climate sensitivities was first established in the report by Drew Charney for the US National Academy of Sciences and the US government in 1979. And in the AR5, the latest assessment report of 2013, the IPCC has exactly the same interval, 1.5 to 4.5 Kelvin. Billions spent, tens of billions spent, Absolutely no advance made at all in <laughs> constraining climate sensitivity to within a lesser interval than the, that huge three degree range. Now the odd thing about this graph is that it is so, that what they're saying is there's such a large possibility of, of, of warming. If you just push the right hand purple line a bit to the right, getting towards one there, you can get 10 Celsius of warming per doubling the CO2, Murphy 2008, and again 2009, said so we can't rule that out because of this curve. <laughs> now, to me, when you look at the thermostasis I just showed you in the previous slide, there's something odd about that interval of climate sensitivities and, and, and that closeness of the feedback factors to the discontinuity and unity in the hyperbolic curve. So what has gone wrong? In this presentation, I shall be providing you with an indication of the reasons why they are unable to constrict climate sensitivity. And I'm going to show you and them how to do that. Something which has eluded climate science for the last 30 or 40 years. If we go to the next slide and then go backwards and forwards between those two for 10 times, if you would. You can see that the reason why they're getting the central estimate so exaggerated is that they're not taking the central estimate of the climate sensitivity from their central estimate of the feedback sum. Keep doing it, and yet yeah, it's good exercise for our gallant. <laughs> um, and the, the, what happens is that because they have this very wide interval of feedback sums, what they should do, because it's the wide interval of feedback sums that leads to the wide interval of climate sensitivity, they should choose as their central estimate of climate sensitivity, a central estimate calculated from the feedback sum. Stop it there. And there is the correct position. And it should, if they were right about the rest of it, be 2.2 Kelvin and not the 3 or 3.2 Kelvin that the current models are predicting. So if you take the 3.2 they're predicting, divided by the 2.22 is right, already that's a 44.1% exaggeration of the central estimate just because they don't understand the characteristics of a rectangular hyperbolic curve as well as Piers Corbyn does. <laughs> Next slide. And thank you, sir, for that gallant job of animating that <laughs> science. Give him a round of applause. He's been a very good <laughs> Now, the second error we're looking at here is the exaggerated estimate they make of the climate sensitivity parameter lambda zero, which, to a first approximation, is simply the first uh, derivative of the Stefan Boltzmann equation with respect to the temperature and corresponding flux. 
that would obtain at what is known as the emission altitude, one optical depth into the atmosphere to about five kilometers up. That's if uh, Ned Nikolov is, is not right, of course. Uh, I defer to him on that, but we're going to stick for the moment with the way they do it, but I think he has a lot to, uh, to say about this. But let's go on to the next slide. Now here, then, is the, uh, the basic flux that you get coming in at that altitude, and that you simply calculate it from the, uh, the sunlight, the, the total solar radius of 1361 watts per square meter, you need the albedo, I take it to approximately 0.3, and then you just use that formula, it gives you the, the flux. Uh, then we add the CO2 uh, rate of flux, 5.35 times the natural logarithm of 2, it's a logarithmic relation approximately speaking, that's the official equation for that, 3.708 watts per meter per W. You add those two together, that gives you the new and amplified forcing before we start doing anything about feedback. Now, in order to do something about feedback, we need to have a parameter that relates the feedback to the temperature change. And we, we do that with uh, looking, first of all, we see that the uh, temperature at the Paris emission levels is about 255 Kelvin, uh, and uh, likewise the temperature after you've added the 3.7 watts per meter goes up to about 2.5. 6 Kelvin, so it's, it's 206, 256 Kelvin, about 1 Kelvin above, it's 0.985. They say that it's 0.312 times 3.78. Where do they get 0.312 from? What they do is instead of taking the flux and temperature at the same altitude, because that's where they are properly related, they say, why don't we take the flux from 5 kilometers up in the atmosphere and compare it with the temperature at the hard deck surface where we live and move and have our being, five kilometers down here. Mm. Now that is a total abuse of the way that equation works. This device for amplifying climate sensitivity was invented by a character called Michael Schlesinger in a paper in 1985. And once again, that adds another 17.7% to the uh, overstep the global warming, taking those two together, we're now up to about a 70% generation of the central estimate. On we go. Next slide, that's it. And here you see that fundamental equation of relative transfer, there it is in all its glory. It simply says that the flux at a particular altitude is, a particular surface, I should say, is the emission, uh, the emissivity rather, or absorptivity at that surface, which is typically around about one. In the, in, the, in the Earth's surface and indeed at the at altitude, so we use it as one. There's a Stefan Boltzmann constant, which is uh, not shown sure there, but it's approximately 5.6704 times 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin, uh, sorry, watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power, and that's the, the constant derived originally by uh, Joseph Stefan, the only slowly after whom the equation has been named. It's proved 15 years later, so late last century, uh, sorry, late, late 19th century, by his Austrian pupil Ludwig Boltzmann, who later went on to commit suicide because he um, couldn't convince the world that atoms existed. But anyway, they did get this right. It was proved by reference to Planck's black body law. So that's the correct way of finding that first differential, uh, where you do it at the same altitude. And then you get the incorrect way where they use the surface temperature against the uh, flux at altitude, which gives you this bastardized and exaggerated quantity. On to the next slide. Now here we do a little bit of simple calculation to show what the effect of that particular exaggeration is. And we find that instead of 3.2 Celsius of warming, I'm not going to get through these calculations, you can check them all later, they're very straightforward. Uh, it's only 1.7 Kelvin of warming, and so we've already got an exaggeration which is very close to a doubling, uh, thanks to these three mistakes we've identified so far. On we go. Next slide, that's it. Now the, the next error is the exaggerated water vapor feedback. This is a question I've had from one or two of you today already. On we go. Next slide, that's it. Here you will see the predictions of the um, hot spot that should occur in the tropical mid-troposphere, a differential warming of two or three times uh, what is happening at the tropical surface, if and only if global warming is to blame. 
And you'll see this in several, first of all, it's in the IPCC 2007 report at the top there, Lee et al. 2007 here, and the 2006 report for the US government on the right. Next slide. But in reality, there's the HADAC 2 measurements. It doesn't actually exist. Next slide. And you'll see, in fact, that in 73 models measured by Christie in 2013, they found that there was an overprediction of temperature at that altitude because they are wrongly imagining that there's a large concentration of water vapor going to happen there as the world warms, and it's not happening. Next slide. And here is a paper from uh, David Douglas and Spencer and Christie, and uh, this was also with Fred Singer, and Fred Singer is the main author of this, and it shows that once again the climate models at the top, and then the observations at the bottom. This shows a major failure of prediction of the water vapor feedback. Next slide. And there again is confirmation of it, this time in the ISCCP data. Now, not every data set shows this, but the NOAA water vapor project does, and there's increasing realization that this is the case. Next slide. And therefore, we can recalculate, and we find that if we halve the water vapor feedback, we should really remove it altogether. It's not there at the moment. But if we halve it, then your temperature comes down to just 1.5 Kelvin per WCO2. Next slide. And now the official fourth error. This is the big one. This is the one which, once we correct for it, allows the constraint of climate sensitivity to be the reasonable bound. And here again you see that slide with the 3.2 Kelvin this time shown on it of this curve and these very, very exaggerated feedback factors. That's our problem. How do we get those feedback factors below the green line there, which is roughly where process engineers were designing electronic circuits. They didn't want it to oscillate and they weren't sure about the component field operating conditions. They wanted stability. They would try to design in as little positive feedback as they could. Next slide. And here is the way the models do it. This is the way they use the feedback here. And you'll notice that the inputs are the changes in temperature. The initial change in temperature is the input. If there's no feedback, then that's the output. But then if it's the input, if there is a feedback loop, then you take that feedback, you multiply it by the output, and that gives you the additional input, which is summed with the original input, and that gives you your final sensitivity. Next slide, here is how they should do it. They should do it, first of all, not using temperatures, but using fluxes, because that's what's driving all this. Secondly, if you are to implement correctly the equations of feedback, which are derived from electronic circuitry, specifically from Bode 1945, where Hansen 1984 and Schlesinger 1985 got them from, then you have to use the absolute value of the flux when you start, before you do any amplification, and you must not just use the delta as your input. This is a very big error on their part. It's a total misunderstanding of how feedback calculations are done. This is built in now to every kind of model. And then the amplifier is your direct forcing from CO2, and then with your feedback loop, uh, that is amplified again in turn, and you get the final output. Next slide. We're now going to look at how you determine, when you've got your initial flux, F0 there, what is the factor that you multiply it by in order to get the final flux at the other end from which you can determine by the Stefan Boltzmann equation what your climate sensitivity is. Well, there it is. And you will see here uh, how it's derived. You have, by definition, two simultaneous equations joined by the logical operator for conjunction at the top there. And from that, you can eliminate uh, F1 from both equations, that then gives you F equals F0 times mu, which is the amplification factor from the direct forcing, times, uh, divided by 1 over mu times beta, which is the transmission characteristic of amplification factor in the feedback circuit. And you can compare that with the way that they do it there. Superficially, it looks the same, but actually it's very difficult because they're doing it with deltas and we're doing it with the absolutes. Next slide. So here are the correct figures plugged in. And what you'll see, to your horror, is that exactly the same answer comes out at the bottom. So where is this error? It's still a delta T of 1.5 Kelvin, just as we saw before. But look at the transmission characteristic. Instead of the 0.625, way up towards that discontinuity of 1, we have this 0.008310. It's below the 0.01. 
which is the ideal maximum limit for stability. Exactly as I would have expected when I first raised this problem, there is your answer. That comes right down. But if it doesn't make any difference to the final calculation of climate sensitivity, why does this matter? Well, in one respect, it does matter. Because if you were to use this equation to try to uh, calculate down what the values of beta would be from the limits that are given for climate sensitivity in the published journals in the CMIC 5, CMIC 3, or IPCC reports, you're going to get a far greater variance in the value of uh, beta than you would get if you did it in a different way. And we go, this, this, I don't know, the gray work for, back to where we were, that's it. Here, you see the translation equations between the functions that you will find in Bode 1945, chapter 3, that new beta, which is the equivalent of, of F, the feedback factor used in the climate. You see how you calculate the one from the other, the same with mu, the same with beta individually. There are the values, again, this very low value uh, for mu beta, which is the equivalent of F. That's way, way, way down on that curve. Now, this is how it starts to matter. Next slide. What you do is you take the central calculations there, and then at the top, and where it says amplification factor beta, line three of that table, you, you take the two sigma variances in feedback factors published in Vialet al. 2013, the official integration of the model results of the CBIT5 models. That's the official paper that does that. And they have a standard deviation for the total feedback factor of about 0.2. So you allow, so 0.2, that's right, so we're going to take two standard units, 0.4 in each direction. You calculate beta by taking the central value <coughs> and going 0.4 down or 0.4 up, and then you run the calculations through. And look what happens to climate sensitivity. The interval is now 1.3, 1.5, 1.7. Only 0.2 Celsius rather than 1.5 Celsius either side of the central estimate. Next slide, when we're near the end now. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. There is one more error we need to look at. <laughs> this one I'm grateful to Will Happer for. Next slide. Here are the equations for line shapes to, to work out just how much your forcing is actually going to be. And these are the equations that they use sometimes with various charges attached to them in the models. As you will see, the one startling thing about these equations is there is no provision for any time delay in the excitation and de-excitation collisions of the photons with the CO2 molecules that set up the resonance in one of the vibrational nodes and give you the heat. And that is because in optical physics from which these equations come, the time delay is not a great issue. In climate science, however, as Will Hacker pointed out in a distinguished paper to the World Federation of Scientists this time last year, if you assume, as the models do, instantaneity in those equations, when in fact there is a delay of a few picoseconds in the uh, excitation and de-excitation, you in effect overstate climate sensitivity by 40%, because you're overstating the, the rate of enforcement by 40%. Next slide, please. And here you can see the difference at the far wings of the line shapes between the uh, Lorentzian and Voigt equations and the equations as adjusted to allow for this time delay. Next slide. And that brings climate sensitivity down again uh, using the Hacker sensitivity factor there. We divide the previous final sensitivity by 1.4 to allow for this factor. And then you get your final sensitivity for this program, you can see the exaggeration factors there. They nearly tripled the central estimate and considerably more than tripled the high end estimate of sensitivity. Next slide. The bottom line then is that climate sensitivity is, next slide, is roughly that. That is using their own arguments. I don't tell you that that figure is right. I suspect it's even less than this actually. But using their own arguments, correcting for those four errors that I have identified for you. That is how far climate sensitivity comes down, and all of those errors are undeniable. They can't say this is a, a misinterpretation or you'll use it one way or the other. No. These are frank scientific errors in the quantification and determination of climate sensitivity. Next slide. 
The moral question which uh, the Reverend Philip Foster very rightly raised, I want to end very briefly with this. Next slide. This is what happens even in the West if you have very heavy taxes on energy. This is a Labour compared with the previous Liberal government in Australia a few years ago, done by a Liberal senator, so there may be a political language on this, I wouldn't deny it, but nevertheless you can see what happens if you start putting these huge subsidies onto so-called green energy and then making the poor pay for them. It's a poll tax on the poor. Next slide. As you can see, there is a very good correlation between life expectancy in years versus CO2 emissions country by country. And if you look at the next slide, you will see that the child mortality per thousand born versus CO2 emissions, that goes the other way. So CO2 emissions are good for bringing poverty down, a point that, that Philip was at on Brexit there. Next slide. And here is Africa's energy cycle. The energy source is timber, carried on the backs of the people, burnt in smoke through a pus. And a UN report that came out just last year estimates that 2 million people a year die just from the smoke in those huts because they haven't got the facility to put the coal, which is abundant in Africa, into coal-fired power stations, generate the electricity cleanly that way, and then have power without having this agonizing energy cycle they have now. And altogether, I suspect it's something like a holocaust every year. Six million people are dying out of the 1.2 billion who don't have electricity. Because we are faffing around, worrying about global warming, which I now declare a scare that is over. Yeah. Yeah. These errors are undeniable that they have made. There is no way back from this moment. You were here when it was finally exposed. Next slide. <laughs> These are the people to whom we owe an obligation to get our science right. Because if we get it wrong, they die. And if there is one purpose in this conference, it is that we have the moral sense that whatever it costs us in reputation, as our reputations are trashed by those who will not do the mathematics and will not do the science, and will only follow the party line, it is we who stand up here and say we will not be moved, we will not have our free speech taken away, we will do our free scientific inquiry, we will draw what I believe are the correct conclusions and we will present those conclusions to the world and that will be the end of that. Thank you. Final question session. Okay, one, two. Question to Mr. Thomanton. Sir. My lord, <laughs> I'm afraid it's even worse because you have addressed only positive feedbacks. But you know that there are people from Richard Linson. Spencer and Basswell who consider negative feedbacks. Yeah. Not to mention a very distinguished paper by four um, learned authors, including me, in the Chinese Science yeah. Bulletin, the Chinese Academy of Sciences in January last year, making the very point you're about to make. <laughs> <laughs> this was the point of this morning, your paper. <laughs> so, if we consider now negative feedbacks, the mechanism is very simple. Yes. When there is warming, there is more water vapor, yes. which condense to make more clouds. Yes. And the clouds have an albedo effect that might be at increase, increase cooling, actually. And this gives a negative I agree with that analysis. I believe that that is the case. But I cannot demonstrate it. I cannot prove it. In this what I have done before you today is to prove 
the mistakes that I have proved. That's not to say that the figure for climate sensitivity that I showed at the end is the true figure. I consider it, as you do, still too high. And I think that Professor Lindzen, we have also, um, as you rightly mentioned, um, Spencer and Braswell, who've done that distinguished work on cloud feedbacks, following a paper again by me, published several years previously, making exactly the same point, but I won't claim the credit for it. They, they did it properly. Um, it is quite clear that negative feedbacks are not only a real possibility, but in fact, a priori, they're rather likely in a climate which shows the near-perfect thermostasis of the last 810,000 years, if you can infer, infer from the ratios of uh, oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 in the Antarctic ice cores. So I agree with you, and indeed I'm familiar with the work of Harold S. Black in 1928 at the Bell Labs where he first discovered the notion of, of negative feedback when he was on the Lackawanna ferry, ferry on his way to work, and he scribbled the notions down on a piece of newspaper, which they still revere and hold in one of their glass cases at Bell Labs, because that's where it was invented. He then tried to apply for a patent for the idea of an electronic circuit in incorporating negative feedback, which can be a very useful thing. And he couldn't get one until he was able to demonstrate them to them that there were 72 of these circuits that had been built and were in operation and working. And only then would they give him a, a patent for it because they thought it was magic. They didn't really think it was true science. We do now know that, that negative feedback is very much part of science. We know, of course, that the lapse rate feedback is a negative feedback. Even the IPCC admits this. And the question is, you know, when we will ever find out whether we can ever get good enough measurements to establish that the, the water vapor feedback is also a negative feedback and not very strongly positive. And also that Spencer and Braswell write that the cloud feedback is negative. I would have thought intuitively the cloud feedback ought to be negative. So I agree with you, sir. I think you're right, but I can't prove it. And all I've shown you today is what, in my submission, I have proven. But if I haven't, I want this distinguished audience of professors and doctors and fathers of science to tell me that I have got it wrong. I'm a layman. I won't burst into tears. Well, not much anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is uh, rather a comment uh, for, for Lord Bunton. Uh, with regard to uh, the positive negative feedbacks, I do believe in our uh, analysis of the planet structure so suggests that the negative feedback, uh, the feedbacks are negative. They are not positive. And the system is well bound and constrained and there is no erratic behavior in the system. And one thing I would point out that I didn't mention in my, my presentation because there was not enough time is the fact that our relationship to describe so well the temperatures, average temperatures across the planet, does not include a huge variation of albedo that is actually observed. The implication being that the albedo actually, or at least the bulk of the albedo for each planet, is a intrinsic property of the climate system itself. It's not a controller of the, of the surface temperature. Now, one thing, the second thing I want to mention is that your calculation about the uh, safe sensitivity of the climate system with respect to uh, 3.7 watts per square meter of soap radiation, which is attributed to the doubling of the CO2, yeah. uh, we, with our analysis, I get almost exactly the same result of a different pathway, which is 1.09, basically 1.1, the same, and that's the total sensitivity of the system to everything, including all the feedbacks, because our calculations are derived from the integral function to describe the temperatures across those clients uh, uh, accurately. The other point is that the uh, 3.7 watts, uh, this is a period for doubling of CO2, the CO2 is not a source of energy. This is, this is a mistake because it comes from decoupling of convection from radiative transfer, but that's how they get it. So there is, regardless of the CO2, how much it will increase, there will be no increase in actual amount of energy, new energy coming into the system. What happens is that you can be exhibited in the atmosphere of optical depth. The downwelling of radiation may increase, but this will be compensated by increased convective heating, uh, convective cooling of the surface. So because you're talking about the same energy that already came from the sun, it's just a matter of a redistribution. There is no energy coming from the outside of the system. In order to increase or change the temperature of the system, you have to have a net energy coming in from the outside, not internally, you know. So, so uh, and the, third, the last point about the uh, uh, feedback, 
the water vapor feedback that is so well discussed, you know, in IPCC and all the, the kind of literature is entirely an artifact of the model and the result of it. If you couple the related transfer from convection when you have more water vapor, you increase the optical depth and you, you cause more of water radiation coming down. And that's how maybe in reality there is no effect of water vapor. I mean the water vapor could not cause an increase of the temperature or something. That's not possible. So it's, it's not even existing. But the positive feedback that they have uh, reporting is not even there. Okay, we'll be back in a little while for the general discussion. No, no, no more small talks there. Okay, my friends. Well, welcome we back. Final session. The general discussion. I will give you a few slides. The general discussion about rules, open, respectful to other opinions, except freedoms where they swing the sword of truth. But there you are, the lot And then we have the picture here. Is it a rabbit or a rabbit? Both things are as correct. And many things in science are like that. It depends on your own history and how you are looking upon it. And we must be respectful for that. But if, when anybody comes and claims that it's a rat, you know, then we have to swing this way. <laughs> and I think we have had many examples during these two days where facts have really been classified here, uh, not in the picture. Okay. Oh. Oh. What was this? Hello. Wait. Oh. No, 
Then there was another one before. You took it out. Uh, okay. That was that was the uh, it was Josh drawing. It was a um, sketch to this drawing. And then he called it rat if occasion. And I thought that would be very nice. A rat. And that's why I wanted to have it. But now it was taken out because it was a sketch. But it's so nice to sketch because it ended up with this very talented man, Josh Katowicz. Um, and it contains so many things. But, uh, what is this? Okay. Um, how much do we really know about climate change? Not so much as we might love it. And we should not pretend otherwise. You know which philosopher wrote this? That was it was not Aristotle or Neanderthal. It was Michael Jefferson, 2010. Really very interesting. Professor Michael Jefferson, dear Mike, you have a background close to the IPCC. Though you have always kept the true scientific view of question, that's that's the sign of science. At this conference, you have been exposed to new observational facts. It would be most interesting if you would be so kind as to summarize your impressions. <laughs> so I will call upon you, uh, and that gives uh, the good beginning of respect. But wait, I will call upon you. I ask in the, the, a few more slides. Very recently, this paper came out from these, board, these people, and it said, only a global zero carbon roadmap will put the world on a course to phase out greenhouse gas emissions hmm. and create the essential carbon sink of the world, which, without which world pro uh, prosperity is not possible. Okay? That's a very strong statement. Against that stands this one, but I think natural phenomena, man made, and, and we had this wonderful picture of, of Lord Bolton with the starving children. This is real world, real world. But I think many of these things are very much imagined and exaggerated. And I may have been put it a little too hard, but I did it earlier. I really think I'm allowed to swing this order. Sorry. <laughs> And um, the next thing is also what Jarmar uh, Munchi said. He should have been here, but I hear he's not here, isn't he? No. Um, this from the international organizations. They have moved from tackling poverty to tackling climate change. And that's when they forgot all those poor people which were in <coughs> Also, something at least I think it's that's one of the reasons why we cannot be silent. And if we are silent, we are a part of something which is not good. So we have to say something about this low the road to a low carbon utilization. Um, our friend um, Alves de Glacier, he gave a wonderful speech on, on uh, the agriculture side of it. So. Why should there be any reason if you listen to him to go into a low, low carbon earth? And many things for the rest of us. So this is something which we may discuss. But you could discuss anything you want. And now with a wonderful contribution uh, of today's morning, where we discussed that the CO2 driven global warming and post uh, post-war rise have Little, maybe negative effect on global temperature, no effect on sea level, negative effect on acidification. So, this is a very good argument of this discussion about carbon earth. Uh, and then we have flexing. This is the same of flexing, leaving leaving the climatic. Uh, and those people who were shaking their hands 
and having some uh, the things caused behind their back and the, the sword was falling uh, around the feet of them. There are many problems there. What is the solution to this? We try to do what we can as simple scientists. It's simple in the way that we cannot reach out to those who decide. But not simple when it comes to knowledge. Because we are a car carrier of the data and information. And that's what we have in here. Uh, so we ask, what is the solution? How should we go forward? And that is maybe what, what you are being talking about. So we could connect uh, your talk with, I don't know, uh, Roger, when um, Professor Ward is talking, uh, I'm showing a few ways forward. Then you continue with presenting Flexi. Okay. We say so. Uh, So, this is of course that we were called a rather fringe group discussing aspects of climate, right? What do you And that's why we're not allowed to be uh, in university college for longer. Are you a rather fringe group? Or are you a fringe group? <laughs> are you a fringe group? <laughs> <laughs> fringe group? <laughs> we are the whole street. No, you're not there. Well, you are not the French. But of course, you're supposed to be. You're outside in the decision. But again, when it comes to, to evidence, data, and sharpness, we are certainly not the French. And that's why they have to cut us off. They have to cut us off. Because if they would have listened to us, they are in danger. We are giving them platform to speak as a denial of the Yes, for good reason, and those reasons have been said during the day. And the reality, I think, uh, that is certainly not the fringe group. And the reality time is certainly questionable, to say the least. Okay? Uh, the true science is in favor of solar variability. This is a strong. Uh, yeah. the last day, we had a very strong thing to say. Uh, that there is no true threat from rapid sea level rise, as this was a big threat. Flooding us, but then it is gone, and the oceans um, are not threatened by acidification. Oh, no. uh, that there is no reason uh, uh, increase in extreme weather might have uh, come mm -hmm. and, and so on. And we could not, uh, we don't need to uh, be afraid of, of what the cows are doing this way and that way. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, uh, So, London Conference said, uh, and after this finished, we simply had to have some wine and cheese part. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that I can't thank Madame Kandida because he insisted to have, to have uh, wine and care. But he thought we should have it at the same time in the discussion. I said, no, 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 no. It will be coming. So, we have out in the foyer and have it disordered but very amusing and you are all welcome for that <laughs> and uh, I think we have yes because we have Josh the catalyst which is a wonderful he has a wonderful head. if you have the skill in your different disciplines in, in science he has the skill in his pen and it do the one so he's, he should have told you this, was this the first day? Summary of the first day. Yes, yes. So it's an impression of the first day. This is wonderful to have. Okay? What do you say? There are some people who need the paradise. And the sun is very happy because my name is in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, is going up and down. We will escape that and um, show this enormous precision of how the things here were seen in our area. And the same with um, Solheim's run one of the And so on and so on. And then we have one more picture. Really? Oh yes, it's two days. Okay, well we have that. We have, oh this is Marias, this is when we call it and you can see the volume, see the trees on the stage. Cold is in this extremely extreme weather. We don't recognize this man. We recognize this man. But it's you. Who is this? Okay. Well, oh, there is a stage. Yes. So, 
we have all these fantastic documents. And dear Josh, thank you. So please, uh, Michael, would you be so kind to say something? <laughs> Wherever you want. You should come up so we can see you. with warming the chaleur. I think that really began with that 1896 article, the front page of which was shown yesterday, uh, from Santi Arrhenius, confusing uh, the greenhouse effect and the Earth's atmosphere with the greenhouse. So let me jump a few decades. I happened to be at a boarding school where my geography master persuaded me to go get up very early every morning, uh, some distance out into a field to examine weather instruments. And that started my interest in this subject. They were mere economists. And so I found myself in 1991 uh, with, in meetings, uh, preliminary meetings with uh, uh, Sir John Houghton. He was chairing the meetings and he was um, the chair of Working Group 1 of the Government of Panic Climate Change. And I was working with the World Energy Council, having spent many years at Shell, on uh, um, uh, Energy for Tomorrow's World, which is a book that was published in 1993. And as a result of that, I provided Sir John Houghton with all the energy input into this book on uh, global warming, the complete guide. You notice the complete guide. That makes me nervous, I don't know about you. <laughs> anyway, um, during this process, uh, I got concerned and I said, John, what about solar variability? Oh, he said, that nonsense. There's a Milankovitch cycle, and then there's the 11 year cycle. Yeah, but, yeah, John, are you in the Milankovitch cycle, 95,000 to 125,000 year cycle? What about the Tommy Sage? You know, what about the Wanda? Because at that point, when, back to 1976, in fact, um, I had read uh, John Eddy's paper on, on that subject. And he continued in this way. And so, if you've seen any of the stuff I've written uh, in more recent years, uh, I point out that Sir John Houghton, as well as having been a director of the Hadley Centre, top uh, UK meteorologist, chairman of the uh, Working Group One, uh, also a Baptist lay preacher, and I pointed out that in this particular area, it seems to me that his Baptist lay preacher uh, and leaders were overriding his scientific uh, analysis. Now, as far as the IPCC itself is concerned, I have been the lead author, contributing author um, in working groups two and three, I mean, in the synthesis report writing group uh, for the 1997 document. Um, I've also been an editorial reviewer and an expert reviewer. It has fascinated me, uh, all those processes. As authors, one could pretty well write out what one wanted. And it, in my case, when I was personally involved, it wasn't changed very much. What worried me much more apart from some of the stuff I saw coming out of Working Group 1 and some of the things that came out in the middle of the period from Working Group 2, uh, was that the role of editorial review, which was to insist that, ex that government review comments and expert review comments be taken seriously. In fact, a number of the authors would try to object to that. Now, it's fine if they were legitimate, scientific or you know, other analytical objections, but it went further than that. It 
because those authors were frequently bitten by the global warming fever. So they were much less scientists than, in fact, some of the government and expert viewers who were making these negative comments. And then when it comes to the role of expert reviewers, their views, their analysis, their published work, you can put it in, but whether it's reflected in the final reports, you don't know. And I think the final thing I would say is that you really ought to look carefully at some of the full reports. We talked about climate models. And you see in the fifth assessment that 111 out of 114 climate models, which the IPCC regard as good and relevant, 111, in their view, have already been overstating warming. Well, that gives you a clue to the fact that probably 111 out of 114, in their view, are no bloody good. <laughs> but you look at this and think, oh, I didn't see it in the policy summary, did I? No, you didn't. Yes, you saw it in the technical summary. Briefly. So I think, you know, if we're going to examine these things, we've really got to do an awful lot of work just to see what some of the authors have actually managed to get away with in the original chapters, but which have somehow disappeared in the summaries. So that basically is what 20 odd years of experience of the IPCC. Thank you very, very much. Yes, dear Mike, it was so nice that you summarized it, and that that's, we should look upon it in this way, yes. At the same time, of course, um, it is bothering that so-called uh, group of scientists uh, pre present something which is going to the politicians, which reads it and changes it, and then it's going back and the original material which was presented by the scientists has to be changed in line with what the politician says. Mm -hmm. This is a very odd way of doing it. Then, of course, every chapter in IPC is very different. Some are probably even excellent, but some are really catastrophic. I have been expert, <coughs> expert reviewer in sea level, and I was, of course, very, very surprised that is was 38 orders, not a single person of those that was a sea level specialist. <coughs> but three meteorologists from Austria, and as I said, Austria doesn't even have a coast. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can be out of it. But it was, some places were very problematic. The, I know we're, we're Paul Wright we're talking about the malaria. All the specialists were out of it. So we have such things which are Bothered, very much bothered. But uh, thank you very much to have all this. Uh, this thing. So, you want to go to Texas tomorrow? Right? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. And then you have on this. Thank you, Nicholas. And uh, afternoon again, everybody. Uh, just want to say some words about. Flexit, and uh, this is a new international organisation that's been started by Viv Forbes in Australia and uh, also involving Lord Christopher Monkton uh, and Mark Morano in the States who were originally contacted and said, yeah, this is a great idea, we should try and get an international movement going to follow on from Brexit, we should move <laughs> to Clexit. <laughs> And because I was involved with the, uh, with the Brexit campaign, I've, I've ended up being involved with this as well. I, I uh, became full-time working for the Leave campaign as the regional director of the uh, Leave the EU campaign in Yorkshire at Humberside, my home county, where I'm glad to report we returned a 58 to 42 majority. So, you know, and it was something that was said yesterday when, when somebody raised the issue of, you know, what can we do to, for the outreach? How can we get the message across 
was the question that was raised yesterday afternoon in the final discussion. And various ideas were put forward. And there were some people who probably more strong, you know, strongly uh, want to do just the science, were saying, well, we have to win the scientific argument. And then other people who were maybe more politically minded were saying, you know, we need to you know, attack government policy and uh, get that in the media. And somebody else said, well, actually, what's something we can all do, whether we're scientists or whether we're not, or, you know, is we can go and just talk to the people we know. Talk to people in our workplaces, in our social settings, and just explain to them, you know, what's gone wrong with climate science and what's gone wrong with the way that money is being used and abused, you know, in, in trying to tackle a non-problem to the detriment of solving real problems in the world, such as the poverty uh, and alleviating the suffering of people who don't have clean water, uh, people who don't have access to cheap and abundant electricity, as Christopher pointed out. So, that's what I was doing in the Brexit campaign, was actually just meeting ordinary people wherever I went and putting across the, the arguments that we thought were, were the right arguments for leaving the European Union, that we should bring democracy back to our country, give ordinary people a, more of a voice and a say in the way that, that things are done. And I think that that's something we can carry through into Clexit as well, as well as being a sort of international movement um, involving all the countries in the world, it involves all the people in all those countries. And so we as individuals can make a difference. And I'm just going to read a, a little bit from, from Viv, For Viv Forbes' summary statement about what Clexit is and what it aims to do. Uh, because he's not here himself, he's kicked this off. You can read more of, of this summary and more of the other documents that he's produced at uh, clexit.net. Um, so please do that and please become involved. We already had a, have over 65, 70 economists, scientists and people from around the world who want to become involved with this campaign and I hope that you all come and join it as well. But I'm just going to read a few of Vince's words. He says, uh, Clexit, the climate exit, was inspired by the Brexit decision of the British people to withdraw from the increasingly dictatorial grasp of the EU bureaucracy. Without any publicity or serious recruiting, Clexit's attracted over 60 well-informed science, business and economic leaders from 18 countries. Uh, the Secretary of Clexit, Mr Viv Forbes from Australia, said that widespread enforcement of the climate, Paris Climate Treaty would be a global tragedy. For the EU and the rest of the Western world, ratification and enforcement of the Paris Treaty and all the other associated decrees and agendas would herald the end of low-cost hydrocarbon transport and electricity and the exit of their manufacturing, processing and refining industries to countries with low-cost energy. For developing countries, the Paris Treaty would deny them the benefits of reliable low-cost hydrocarbon energy, compelling them to rely on biomass heating and costly, weather-dependent and unreliable power supplies, thus prolonging and increasing their dependency on international handouts. They will soon resent being told to remain forever in an energy-deprived, wind, solar, wood, bicycle economy. <laughs> Perhaps the most insidious feature of the UN Climate Plan is the Green Climate Fund. Under this scheme, selected nations, the rich, are marked to pour billions of dollars into a green slush fund. The funds will then be used to bribe other countries, developing and emerging nations, into adopting silly green energy policies. Naturally, some smart politicians and speculators in the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, and in the small island nations, understand that they can profit from the Paris Treaty by garnering the rules, by gaming the rules on things like carbon credits, or building a green fund for climate compensation, or green energy technology. This will only work for a while, and when the handouts stop, the readjustment to reality will be very painful. This UN-driven war on carbon energy has already caused massive losses and dislocation of Western industry. If allowed to continue as envisaged by the Paris Climate Treaty, this economic recession will become a worldwide depression and then all nations will suffer. We must stop this futile waste of community savings, cease the destruction and dislocation of human industry, stop killing rare bats and birds with wind turbine blades and solar thermal sizzlers 
stop pelletizing trees and shipping them across the world to feed the power stations designed to burn coal, and stop converting food to motor vehicle fuel, and stop the clearing of bush and forest for biofuel cultivation and plantations. Carbon dioxide does not control the climate. It's essential plant food, and more carbon dioxide will more, produce more plant growth and a greener globe. So, you know, this really plugged into the key issues here, and a lot of these issues have been raised and amplified by the speakers we've had here over the last two days. It shows that we are all coming together, even though we haven't, you know, had the expensive conferences that we all get paid to go to, and all of these gatherings where we can start singing from the same hymn sheet. In fact, just our own natural knowledge, our own insight, has brought us to the same conclusions, and brought us into a, a common purpose to do away with this nonsense from the UN, to liberate people's lives, to make sure that they do have cheap, available and abundant energy sources to improve their lives with, and that's what we all need to fight for. So I hope that you'll visit Clexit.net, have a look at what Viv's put up there, and as the movement grows and moves forward, please join it, please come along, and let's make it happen. Thank you. Flexit.net. Go there. Join it. And you can read on page 79. Uh, you can say, truth has a way of uh, um, accumulate over time until even the best crafted untruth can, uh, cannot be maintained. And that is what the story said. It's very interesting. We are here now, right? Please, Peter, you have another thing to say? Could you get your... The climate battlefield has changed immensely in the last nine months. 180 degrees. And what I want to suggest is a couple of ways that we might deal with that. How we're going to be most effective. Following the route we've been following has been frustrating. And I think if we think carefully about where we want to go, it might get the best use of our energy. Now, what has changed is that the IPCC was formulated to demonstrate consensus for the purpose of getting politicians to spend the money to reduce carbon dioxide. They won. They now occupy the high ground. The problem is the high ground is crumbling. And so what we need to do, where we're going to be most effective, is to help that high ground crumble. Battling them straight on with equations and interpretations and data, forget it. In many ways, we're dealing with the general public now. So what I'm saying up here is our goal is to encourage politicians and the people who vote for them to wonder whether greenhouse gas theory is correct. And I use the word theory, and I think we all want to emphasize theory. Every time we talk about global warming, global warming theory, greenhouse warming theory, or hypothesis. Or hypothesis. Or bullshit. Either way. Either way. I mean, theory is something the general public understands very clearly. Us scientists know the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. But what I'm talking about now is how we communicate with the public. Because it's the public that's going to shame the scientists into having to deal with certain issues. <laughs> Can you change the slide, please? So the first thing I found is very important. I should start out by saying I've had the privilege in the last year and a half of twice going to the National Publicity Summit in New York City. And during that summit, I had the privilege of making a pitch to 50 of the top TV, radio, and print producers. The pitch was 30 seconds. I had two and a half more minutes to talk to them. I got a lot of experience in how you communicate. I got a lot of training, first of all, and then experience in how you communicate to people that run television stations and how they communicate to the world and what their problems are. And one of the issues that got through very quickly was, did you know that it has never been shown experimentally that increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases actually cause air to warm? And they go, what? <laughs> The only experiment that's been documented in the scientific literature was Moon Angstrom in 1900. We heard wonderful things from down there. Um, this is embarrassing. 
It is really embarrassing that CO2 has gotten us close to spending $10 trillion. That's $1,000 for every man, woman, and children on Earth. And it's never been shown. Our job is to embarrass the scientists. And this was the reason why I'm offering $10,000. $10,000 is a lot of money to me. Some people have suggested it should be a million. No. If you want to defend greenhouse gas, then you've got to do this experiment. If you can't do this experiment, you can't defend greenhouse gas. I mean, what can be more straightforward than to show if you add CO2, the air gets warmer? Forget about climate sensitivity. I mean, there may be other complications. But if you can't even show the air gets warmer, forget it. You're out. So this is why we need to do that. And this is done on my website. Uh, the whole challenge is spelled out specifically. That's the whole idea of approval. OK, number two, climate models predict that you will get hotter standing in moonlight, that's infrared, than standing in sunlight. Is that your experience? <laughs> yeah. This is the level we need to talk because it is so obvious. It's unbelievable. Climate models assume that thermal energy in radiation is the same at every frequency. But ultraviolet radiation burns your skin and fades your lawn furniture. <coughs> Infrared radiation absorbed by greenhouse gases does not even have enough energy to penetrate glass. It can never burn your skin. Now, I've done 50 radio shows in the last year, and this is the kind of stuff on the radio that really sells. You get through it. Climate models predict that layers of air heated by greenhouse gases warm Earth. But layers of air are colder than Earth. Do you get warm standing next to a cold stove? Now, you can't believe the arguments I've gotten on the internet with people that insist that you can get, get warmer by standing next to a cold stove. But the general public, the average person knows, if you walk up to a cold wood stove, you do not get warm. And yet that's what climate models are saying. They're saying the infrared is warming the Earth more than the ultraviolet. And yet the ultraviolet is 48 times hotter, 48 times more energetic. Detailed records of climate change and layers of ice in Greenland show that at least 25 times in the past 110,000 years, the world warmed suddenly out of the ice age. How can greenhouse gases explain these very clear observations? I think what we want to do, this was of course the subject of my talk, we should do this for, for uh, sea level. We should think of it for all the different things. We want a really simple, straightforward thing that the general public can understand. This gets a little complicated, but I'd like to find a way of simplifying it. But one of the things we can do as a group, is each of us within our specialty, try to come up with a short, quick, terse thing that a person listening to you on the radio or watching you on TV can associate with in their gut and know that that just doesn't feel right. This smells. <laughs> Weather is short-term climate change. It's just turning it around. CO2 can't explain regional weather. Ozone depletion actually gets very closely connected to regional weather. And we're going to be a lot coming out on that in the next year or two. But the important thing is here, you know, they all talk about, well, there's weather. And then there's this climate change and what happens over a long period of time. And that's controlled by CO2. Well, it's the same process, it's just a matter of the time scale you're looking at. We also need to be careful that we speak from a neutral soapbox. I founded a nonprofit called Science Has Never Settled. I name it that way because no scientist who's reputable can disagree with that statement. Even though they might disagree with me, they might think I have the wrong idea on global warming. No reputable scientist can say science has settled. And what I say is, if science has settled, why do we need to pay scientists anymore? <laughs> So our job is to open minds, and you don't open minds by being in their face. The minute you are introduced or mentioned that you're a skeptic or somebody else says that you're a skeptic, that's the way of castigating you and putting you aside. Minds are open when people hear something that they can relate to in their gut and say, hmm, I'd like to think about that. 
I got some coaching from one of the top head coaches in the, in the country, in the United States, and she talked about a walkaway talk. What do you want the people walking out the door of the theater to say about what you just said? And what you really want them to say is, you know, I just heard Dr. Peter Ward talk about this, and that's really interesting. I want to look into that. So we have to open minds. And we don't want to give the others a way of easily dismissing us. Again, this is where names, this is where skeptics, this is where all these other things. If we are acting outrageously, we will get dismissed immediately. If we are speaking back outlandishly, we will be dismissed immediately. People are simply, when they want to defend their position, if they can find a way of dismissing you, then they don't have to worry about you anymore. And so it's very important. So the tables have turned. They're on the defensive now. Mm -hmm. So what I have listed here, we all know, except that in the heat of battle, it's really easy to lose track of this. Be courteous and appreciative of the hard work by all. The scientists that have come up with greenhouse gas theory have worked really, really hard. They've worked as hard as we have, but even more. I've read the history of greenhouse gas theory in great detail, and I can see how it got there. It's an honest mistake by in science. Some people may not be honest about it, but in general, these guys have worked hard, and uh, it doesn't do us any good to bad them or to imply that they had some other reason for doing what they're doing. So always remember, they are at least as passionate about uh, what they're doing as you are about what you're doing. Do not attribute motives to them. Don't say you're being paid by industry, you're being paid. It doesn't matter. We're now battling for public opinion, and we're trying to crumble the high ground they're on as quickly as possible before we waste a huge amount of money. Suggest problems with ideas, but never problems with people. We don't need the, the climate wars have gotten very personal. We just don't need to go there. It's a waste of energy. And it sets people back, it closes their minds. We want to open their minds. Be cool, <coughs> calm, and collected, but display your passion. The most important thing on radio and television is that people feel in their gut your passion. Do not be dogmatic. Be willing to discuss. Uh, I had an interesting experience recently where a guy on the radio called in and he just spouted for 30 seconds, 45 seconds, all gospel according to uh, St. IPCC. And uh, I said, you know, I thought I think he just did a very good job of explaining the way most scientists now look at this. But just it doesn't hurt to be courteous. And it, it helps a lot to be open. Now, I just go and skip to the bottom. Be positive and upbeat. Now, what we're really talking about is what Gandhi summarized here. Mm. We're talking about the way Gandhi behaved, the way Martin Luther King behaved, and others. First, they ignore you. That's what's been going on. Secondly, they laugh at you. And the laughing has been going on, and it's getting worse. And especially as they get nervous, they're going to laugh at you even more. But the nice thing about this, I figure when people are laughing at me, we've made one giant step forward. So I've been relishing, and I've told some people that directly. So first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. So remember it now, the IPC is on the high ground, and the high ground is crumbling. Let's help it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was so good and useful, and it is synthesis of what we are talking about. And of course, uh, this thank you that we may even appreciate the uh, University College of London. <laughs> uh, and the, the manager of this room, which said that they couldn't have, a, have the ad advertisement of our conference in the web because it was controversial. <laughs> and uh, it's written here that they take care of everything, which so to say, uh, but not all right. I wangled an invitation to give a talk at the Geologic Society of London on Tuesday uh, through some high powers. 
they got scared shitless last week. <laughs> but I was a skeptic, and they had looked up my biography on uh, Wikipedia. I won't go through what happened, but it's similar to what happened here, yeah. and it's really sad that yeah. science is headed in that direction. Yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, it's open for discussion. Wait a minute. Anybody continue here? Somebody is running with the, with the mic. Before we don't get started, I want to ask a really important question. You had a slide right at the beginning of this afternoon. Me? With, yes, yes, and it showed an animal. Yes. And apart from the beak, the size of the eye, and the lack of fur, I thought it looked extremely like a rabbit. So my question is, how many legs did it have? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we took away the legs. But if you're, more, if you're really into science, we have, we have been working on the legs. We have given it the solar variability. We have given it a lot of things. And by that, we start to fix it. And I think we have, during those two days, gone a long way forward. Yeah. A long way forward in the solar variability, in the election of, of CO2. And then we start to see one animal or whatever you want, one picture, and the other is sort to say losing the possibility. But uh, we should early see two possibilities, and that's why, but that's why we have are here. We are um, independent scientists, all very, very knowledge in their different uh, opinions. We are not in any way having a backlog on, on being uh, on agendas. We only speak from our best knowledge of the things we know best, and that's our way of science. That's why we are here. Um, we have not been paid by anyone. We have been emptied our pockets. We have, you have helped us to do this. So, for example, I will, uh, Victoria, I would be very su surprised how you can write a bad story for Desmond Globe or for a Guardian or these nice people which have presented so much wonderful material. Could you answer? How could you do it? Victoria, it's a question to you. How would you be able to write a bad story for Desmond Globe or a Guardian about these, all these nice people and all these nice material <laughs> they have been presented? But what is wrong with us? What's the question? What's wrong with us? I decided what story I'm going to write about, yeah. But can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, it's been I'm not sure who to address this to, but it's been mentioned a few times that, um, as we all know, science has been wrong in the past. I wondered if there were any examples of when um, science, as you see it, has been this wrong on this great global scale before. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. 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 So the question was, uh, do we have another example that science has been that long, for that long time? In recent times, we're not talking about the medieval times because they always discounted there was no science, it was just religion, church, and so forth. However, in recent times, in addition to what I'm studying uh, climate, out of curiosity, and doing research, I've been also reading in some other disciplines, and one of them that affects everybody of the past is, for example, the science of nutrition. The science of nutrition, in other words, the diet and so forth, right? And uh, the, what I have found, and this is now getting to the mainstream, is that, for example, the notion, the idea of a uh, low-fat diet is healthy. We've been told this since 1977, since the, uh, uh, the uh, what was the name of the senator, the, the Montgomery report, I believe, was it? In, in the United States. Uh, now it's becoming clear that this was never based on any science. There was no data. There was one person, his name is Ansel Keys, who had to have, he, he was an influential scientist, and he put this idea forward, right? And, uh, and then, you know, it got into the politics and they passed this uh, uh, dietary guidelines that began in the, in the early 80s until today, every five years, the USD updates those guidelines. And then this information gets propagated into the rest of the, of the world. Well, now the mainstream science now, there are, there are a number of meta-analysis and, and, 
export stocking and all this, and the guidelines have begun to change. But what's emerging now that this message, for example, of, of low fat diet being healthy, it's not only incorrect, it's detrimental to the human health. That's why we have the obesity epidemics, we have the, the epidemics of metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and so forth throughout the world. So this is an example that the science uh, in one field of uh, the mainstream is changing basically 180 degrees. What turned out to be a healthy diet, by the way, for human beings with respect to physiology, is what's called a low-carb, high-fat diet. High-fat meaning including butter, you know, olive oil, and even lard, and, and so forth. What is causing the disease is inflammation that's coming from glucose and, and eating carbs. And all the diseases that we have, fructose is especially the bad one. Yeah, fructose is number one, but sugar has 50% fructose yeah, yeah. and the glucose. Oh, okay. So this is a one, one example that, that is, is happening right now. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm Wolfgang from Germany, from IT. Um, Victoria, thanks for this question because this is, for me personally, you know, why I'm actually involved in basically trying to spread. The, the awareness that there is the science is not set the same, at least more than I once believed, you know, when I was in school, that in Germany the forests are irreversibly dying. And when I will be grown up, there won't be forests anymore. It was like irreversible. But that's actually not the point, uh, uh, what I say to answer your question. There is in the 1920s and 30s, there was a phase in science, almost in inverted commas, which the science community uh, preferred to forget after the Second World War, and it was eugenics. Yeah. In eugenics, eugenics uh, the, the concept was the idea behind was that thanks to the improving um, uh, medical services and quality, the so more and more people are able to survive who in the old days just would have died. And there was this idea or the fear that uh, the gene pool would be, yeah, you know, a lot of people today, but it was very, actually, tragic. There was a firm belief among many of the so-called top scientists in the United States, in particular in Europe, that one has to protect the gene pool. And so, if you, you can even Google eugenics, and even if Wikipedia comes up enough, it was a very, very powerful theory, and um, the goal, but if you look up famous research institutes in the United States, which still exist today, actually came into existence during that time to do research on this. And there was even a competition between Europe and the United States, who is more advanced in it. And we know a little bit to what it led with in Germany, because it was also used in you know, <coughs> the so called euthanasia programs. But why I think it's a good example for where science was completely wrong, because everybody who dared to oppose it basically had to write off his career or her career. Yeah. So it basically destroyed people who tried to stop it. And um, anyway, I think it is, it's a dramatic but very powerful example where science was wrong. And of course, the, the ever, the, for the average public, it was of course, again, like an intuitive truth which was wrong. And of course we have the same thing. The same thing. I did in Russia. I'm sorry. John Harrison. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Long uh, I, I will. Uh, I will mention uh, a physical, very simple uh, situation. Uh, scientists wanted to know how old Earth was, and correctly. I think it was Lord Kelvin, and uh, he uh, calculated the age of Earth to be about 60 million years old. And this was accepted by most scientists during that time. And he used um, uh, physical laws and so on, but he was totally wrong. The right age is about a factor 100 more, because he just didn't know about nuclear reaction. And we are in the same situation today. We don't know if planetary dynamics is the absolutely most important driving force for climate.
Thank you. I have a brief comment. Thank you. It was Lord Kelvin in 1898. He gave a speech in uh, Royal Academy of Science, and he claimed this young uh, age. In the auditorium were all these remarkable English uh, geologists who had calculated already at that time that it was about 500 million years, which later with a with a, uh, dating technique was so so very close. But if anyone would have risen their hand, Lord Kelvin in the London fog when we went home said, maybe a thermodynamic equation was what, what could be wrong? And then he was some course, what was missing was uh, um, uh, Madame Curie. Was, was, Radioactivity in the. Thank you, sir. It is a very interesting question. I think that we don't really have an equivalent uh, in the past. The, the closest is a, what Nika said is a Disenko affair. Indeed, it's a, the closest, uh, it, even if it was limited to the Soviet Union and its satellites. Uh, uh, also, Eugenics is also a good example. But the, the problem with these examples is that it's, it creates an association uh, between the war business, uh, to, to, to go brief, and the uh, eugenics. And it, it is a, a term of efficiency when talking to the public. It's, it seems too excessive. Okay, well, uh, the, the, these are not comparable uh, ideas. So uh, I, I prefer a general giving a more neutral <coughs> example of, uh, of failures of uh, scientific method. And so one example is uh, what uh, mathematicians did in the 17th, 18th century to, uh, when, when they started to study um, demography. Because at that time, we, uh, the, the, the data was very sparse, were very sparse, and the only um, data take, taken for granted was biblical data. And so uh, there are uh, two centuries, two really deep uh, studies, uh, two, two centuries of deep studies of demographical uh, things about the uh, biblical population uh, that involve even the top most uh, mathematicians like uh, uh, Leonhard Bario. And uh, well, the question was uh, how could it be that the uh, Hebrews uh, grew so fast when uh, arriving in Egypt they were 70? Then uh, two centuries later, there were more than uh, several hundred uh, thousands, I think. So they, they created models to understand that, and that was interesting. I mean, if we go in the, the theory, what, what they made, it was it was interesting itself, but it was uh, you relied upon complex false data, and in fact, uh, the question was not a good question. <laughs> As a matter of fact, in bracket before I did it. The first ever model in Earth was Aristoteles when he had really made uh, the symmetric movement. Uh, 50, uh, six different mo mo uh, motions, and that could explain everything. With the Earth in the center, with the Earth in the center, not the sun in the center. And of course, that totally wrong model survived for 1,800 years till Copernicus wrote his, his paper in 1554. Uh, it has been adopted by uh, Ptolemaeus, which uh, um, uh, um, Philip talked about. That was the first model. It was completely wrong, but it ruled the world for 1,800 years, and it collapsed 100%. This model, which we have about CO2, have a few years before it collapsed. <laughs> when we are coming into to the cooling period of the next, uh, that nobody could any longer uh, uh, talk about it. So uh, it is a huge close collapse. It's the only thing, now we have been saying that we're getting warming, and we have thrown off all our clothes, and when it's going cold, getting colder, we are staying there naked because all the money was spent on other things. Sorry. First, relax, I'll be brief. This is a more recent story about model collapse and it concerns my own uh, original field of research, membrane bioenergetics. 
in, when I went to university, the gospel truth was that the key element in explaining the biochemical systems for energy transfer were coupled to the so-called energy-rich phosphate bonds, which were to be found inside key biochemical substances like ATP. Anyway, no one had ever isolated those, and it was postulated that that was due to the fact that they were so short-lived that they just didn't have the ability to, to catch them in time. Then there was a known scientist named Peter Mitchell who took quite another view and uh, had a model where he saw the membranes as energy generating entities like uh, condensators, where the potential across the membranes, electric and potential, drove the systems to produce the necessary energy. Anyway, he was laughed at at conferences. What are you doing in science? Fortunately, he was here to skin here and to the for his own private laboratory and assistant. And to make it very short, after a few years, he got the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. And that system he advocated was accepted. And he was honored in a later textbook with uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, words summing up the fate of uh, such a hypothesis theory and after some years of fact. First, they say it's not true. Then they say it's true, but not important. <laughs> then they say it's true and important. That's not new. <laughs> <laughs> this time, they started with the event price and then it's getting it all upset. Could I just give you a <coughs> Again, a, a very brief answer to Victoria's question. It is no part of our contention that science is wrong about the climate. On the contrary, on the two questions that are of most direct policy relevance, which is climate. <coughs> How much warming will we get per doubling of CO2? The vast majority of papers now published on that subject are finding climate sensitivity below, and some of them well below, 2 Celsius per doubling. And if it's below that level, then there is no kind of problem. And the near unanimous majority of the economic papers on whether it is worth mitigating rather than adapting have concluded unquestionably that it is adaptation later rather than attempted mitigation now that is the best way forward. That is, if you like, the mainstream view on the science of climate sensitivity and the mainstream view on the economics of this question. Now these mainstream views are not published as often or as fairly as they should be in the media, because the media, some of them, are corrupt. I could tell you, for instance, of a particular blog site which attacks those of us who have questioned the climate science, which was founded and funded by a convicted internet gaming fraudster by the name of Lefebvre, who was convicted in July three years ago I think four years ago now, of having embezzled $185 million by setting up a bogus bank to launder the illicit proceeds of illegal internet gambling. And that blog site is known as D Smog Blog. That is how it was originally funded. That, so there is a lot of money, some of it from downright corrupt sources being spent to peddle a particular totalitarian political message. And it is no accident that when totalitarians get involved in science, as they did in the eugenics movement, as they did again in the Lysenkoist movement, as they're doing now in the climatist movement, then it is not science that's getting it wrong, it is totalitarian politics getting in the way. And our job as men of science is simply and quietly and authoritatively to convey what we believe to be the scientific truth until those blog sites that are founded and funded by criminals to pursue a criminal agenda eventually are laughed at and are no longer broadcasting the nonsense that they broadcast.
much more. I'd like to expand a little bit on what was already mentioned a few times. But this is an interesting answer, and it actually keys off Lord Monckton's uh, aspect of totalitarianism being the driver for false science. And I'll talk a little bit about Lysenko, because this actually has a happy ending. And it has a happy ending that relates to climate, too. And uh, bear with me if I, if I explain. Lysenko uh, was in Russia at the time that uh, genetics was still being debated. Mendelian genetics with DNA and, and characteristics being passed on, and Lamarckian genetics, which relied on adaptive characteristics. So what did Lysenko do? He takes tadpoles and takes India ink and punches, puts little whole, uh, black dots on their toes. And lo and behold, their progeny had little black dots on their toes. It turns out later on it was found that Lysenko fabricated it. But here's where totalitarianism comes in. Stalin wanted to have people who would grow up to be good communists and obedient. And he thought by genetics, or Lamarckian genetics, adaptive characteristics, they could be taught to be good communists and, bra and breed others. So Lysenko ends up ruling the uh, science establishment in Russia, becomes a head of the National Academy of Sciences. Anybody teaching Mendelian genetics was either sent to the gulag, dismissed, or just they just disappeared. This happened through the, the uh, Second World War, after Lysenko dies, the Russians finally realize, hey, maybe our medicine uh, needs to be improved. They adapted some of the aspects of Mendelian genetics, and here's where the happy ending comes in. The Russians had a station in East Antarctica called Vostok. Vostok means East in, in Russian. And underneath this station, through dynamite sounding, they found out that there was a lake two miles underneath the ice. And this lake had obviously been there for thousands and thousands of years, billions maybe, and the Russians said, we're going to make a contribution now to science. We're going to go into that lake and pull up some of the genetic material and make our contribution to genetics. So they, they start drilling, and the Americans and the British say, don't drill, take ice cores instead. Find out on the way down what the ice is like, how the history is, that's how the ice cores were taken out. They did drill into the lake. They did get this primordial material out. And they did contribute to science. Not bad for a totalitarian, totalitarian ending to good science. <laughs> of course, the thing was really messing up the agriculture part. And because it messed up the agriculture, it hit it back because climate interfered with, with agriculture mm -hmm. and overruled the so-called genetics. That was Pierre's first. Oh. Mm -hmm. and then I have <coughs> uh, yeah, this is actually, it starts off with a question to the Mike had, of course, but uh, it turns into the uh, Lexi. Um, so, Mike uh, as one uh, hyperbolic person to another. <laughs> I'm not rectangular. No, I believe. Um, the, uh, your points about the upper atmosphere, I think, first of all, uh, you know, there's a lot of assumptions in there which are taken as correct. You have to work on what they're saying, that's true. But first of all, the upper atmosphere is not an electric circuit. I mean, that's a mathematical convenience, yes, but, you know, it's, it's a simple test. But it's the one they use. Oh, it's the one they use. No, I accept that. The uh, uh, next problem is that it's not a stacking system. It has uh, big variations on a daily basis. Now, they talk about an average temperature, but given the big variations on a daily basis, you should take the fourth root of the average of a fourth power of the temperatures. Now, if you add CO2, the range of temperatures on a daily basis is going to increase, which will mean the average of the fourth powers will go up. When it goes up, the radiation from these, up, uh, these uh, high altitude levels will increase into space. That would give a cool. And there is, a uh, see, the cold spot. And if you look in the appendix in my presentation, we go into this as to say that can explain the cold spot. Um, now, I don't expect to go into long discussion about that. But you see, the big debate about all this is like killing a dead parrot. 
because you know the, the parrot is already dead to us and you want to kill it again. Well, that's good, but on the other hand, the public are going to not be interested in us killing a dead parrot. Oh, uh, you you ask that later. later. But um, what we do have to do is go to the public. First of all, our own science, we have to go more down the electric universe to work with those people, I think. But in terms of convincing the public, it's evidence in the field, right? Now, there's only, it's very simple to say to the public. One is there is no evidence that CO2 controls temperature. And we demand the other side produce evidence, right? That's a good thing, and they're failing miserably. Secondly, to, for them to be true, it requires a conspiracy of nature, for nature to follow man's CO2. They're 96%, the turbines, 10 times, we produce 10 times man's CO2, have to follow man's bid. So we should have more on turbines. We should demand <laughs> more on turbines and ridicule their whole premise. And of course, the reason is the oh, I better end by saying, <laughs> Politically, we have to go for what CO2 is good, we have to go for alternative media, we have to be ready to take to the streets and demonstrate against lies, you know, demand the BBC with the truth, have pickets, and the overall question is we've got to demand and fight for accountability in politics and science. Absolutely. For example, uh, we have uh, this idea that there are oscillations in the climate uh, that has not been uh, reproduced by the model. This is a well published uh, bit of it. And this oscillation question uh, seriously the validity of this model because it's the model of the oscillation. The implication is that, uh, uh, for example, from my study, is that uh, the models are uh, uh, overestimating the climate sensitivity by at least uh, a factor of two. That means that the, uh, that the real climate sensitivity must be around 1.5 uh, uh, Celsius or less. Even if it is less, uh, as, uh, as uh, Christopher uh, Montpac has shown us, that means that the uh, Temperature record that we have are somehow uh, showing more warming than what uh, is real. So there might be error in the data, there might be urban heat island that is still there, there might be fabrication in the data. And I believe that uh, because there is this uh, political interest in keeping on this, uh, this, uh, this global warming theory, that there is a lot of interest. We need to be very careful that the politics do not uh, uh, try to jack up the science by uh, um, somehow um, providing uh, data that are fake. Yeah. Okay? Because that is very important. So this big organization that are giving us uh, data about the global warming and so on must be double checked. Because what they are doing is very suspicious because uh, there is uh, this uh, kind of uh, continuous adjustment uh, that uh, always show more water than what it was. Yeah. And and this adjustment is unparalleled thing. When we take out the sort of truth. Sorry, you all that. Give me Hello. I have a slightly different perspective, a different view to impress or influence our view on the climate science community at large. How do we do it? I am a retired life member of the American Geophysical Union, which has a membership of over 50,000 people. I have written several times to the president, who is presently Ms. Margaret Lee, and various other executives to provide a different or a balanced view of the climate change. I also send the link to our conference. I believe. Many of you are members of other societies like American Met Society, European Geophysical Society, Royal Met Society. These have membership total about 125,000 people. If we can influence their executive through our individual or collective effort, that they must change and provide a different viewpoint of the present climate change. Unless we do that, I have to use the word, we have no hope in the head. Thank you.
We've seen that proved. And I think that we will go on 
this way, uh, slowly, maybe slowly, but not, but surely with a good basis. We can get Piers uh, Corbin for you in a minute, Andrew. Putting the vitals of the bout in their heads. I'll see if I can get Piers Corbin, Jeremy Corbyn's brother, who is sitting over there. It's very good thing. We need to, to listen to what Peter said, what Mark has said about uh, the organisation, what you said about um, universities, what you have t talked about schools and the importance of it. And therefore, for example, John Eric's boxes where they can do the greenhouse experiment themselves. And it's exciting stuff. So these things are today. But now we have I have the pleasure to give the microphone to um, uh, Christopher Monten to say the concluding words. From now on you will hear nothing from me more. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my brothers and sisters in the love of science, <laughs> have you had a, an exceptionally good conference? No! <laughs> what I am going to say, as a mere layman among the great men and women of science who have graced us with their presence and their learning in these last two days, is that I am in awe of all of you. I am grateful to all of you not only for having come here, but having done so not on expensive private jets <laughs> at the expense of the taxpayers. <laughs> you have paid your own way to be yeah. here, and then on getting here, you had James and uh, Megan standing there extracting donations from you <laughs> so that we could pay the extravagantly large cost of this wonderful hall. So we have a lot to thank all of you for, but in particular, without Nicholas Murner, this conference would not have been possible. <laughs> he, he has laid off this conference, has taken on virtually the entire task of organizing it, and has made this not only one of the most learned conferences that I would have been to, but also unquestionably the most friendly. And this is in no small part owing to you, sir, and your own wonderful character and your high moral courage in the face of the nonsense that gets thrown at all of us. Many of you have told me how you have been personally persecuted, hounded, no. threatened with the loss of your That's job, Lord and some actually having lost your job, because you dared to stand up and speak the truth for science. And if there is one message that I think we should all take away from this conference, is that if we continue quietly, authoritatively, determinedly, to look for the truth, and when we find it, quietly, carefully, humbly, to present it as best we know how, then in the end, the truth will win, as it always does. God bless you all, thank you for coming, and I hope, Nicholas, that we can persuade you to organize another conference <laughs> at this time next year. God bless you all. On the table. Mm. Right, I've just got to pack my stuff away. I'll broadcast again in a minute.
Piers is over there. I'll try and grab him for you in a minute, but I've got to pack my stuff away. Oh, it's broadcast. It's gone out. Uh, I do. Yes, it's all. It's there yesterday. Yesterday was all. I got everything yesterday. So uh, um, unfortunately, I had a bit of network trouble during Piers' speech. So uh, I've not, not caught that. They're, they've been making a film, so it's, it's so long term. There's all professional quality video going to be available. At all. There's a. Next year, because this might Mm-hmm. <laughs> 